everyone's kind of talking tough how pissed off they were. I go into the bathroom, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, it's time for me to go earn my citizenship. So uh, my name is Brian Buckley. I served in the United States Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps for nine years, uh, served in the infantry and served in reconnaissance and in special operations, and I got out as a captain. Grew up in an area right outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania called Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Great area. Uh, what it was really known for back when I was growing up was its outstanding high school football program. It was called Central Box West High School. Typically, they were always nationally ranked, and it was a huge deal. So as a kid, we always kind of joked, like, if you're an able-bodied male, you were getting groomed to play football in our town. And I started playing football at the age of six, uh, met all my friends that were still great friends to this day on a football field together. That was kind of what you worked for. Like, and I mean, when I'm saying like it was a big deal, I mean, media, everything, people used to make jokes. That was during the Eagles, like lean years. Everyone's like, why would you drive to Philadelphia to watch Eagles play when you have this thing right here? So your entire life, or me, I was just, Anything I did was to get to that football program. And I had to start every year I was there. That was like the goal I set as a young kid. Junior high, played all these different sports, but then as soon as you went to high school, I just dropped them and just focused on football all year round. And it was pretty intense. You know, I did share a story at my coach's celebration of life. And his name was Coach Mike Patton. I was saying how I was in a uh, fighting position in, um, in a Iraq. Basically, all the water was filling up the hole. It was like January time frame, so all this crap rain. And I remember it's my turn to finally get some sleep. So I kind of rolled over, threw a weapon across my chest, and my hand was in wet sand. And next thing you know, I'm transported right back to Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And it was August football camp. It was my first practice of the day. So like the morning dew is on my feet, which I hate when my feet would get wet. And my coaches are yelling at me. And I'm thinking to myself, Man, we haven't even started our first practice. He's already yelling at me, and I got another practice after this. And it was at that moment I woke up, looked around, saw the Iraqi landscape, and I thought to myself, thank God I'm in Iraq. I mean, his camps were nuts. And if you get through his camp, you could literally do almost everything. But there was a reason why we were always so good. And what I didn't realize at the time was he was not coaching us about football. I mean, obviously we were learning football, but he was kind of more coaching us about the game of life. And it really paid dividends for me later down the line. And it was kind of ironic, I ended up in the Marine Corps because my coach had a huge love for the United States Marine Corps. He was telling me when he was in high school, recruitment wasn't what it is like today, you know? And he's like, so basically you, just, you decide where you want to go, they mail you the letter, you sign it, and that's it. It's not like a big pomp and circumstance you get. And he was getting recruited by a lot of schools, one being Penn State. So he decided, I'm gonna go to Penn State, told all the other teams, I'm good, this is where I'm going. And I think it was like March, April, May timeframe and no letter's been sent to his house for a scholarship. And he's like, what the heck? So he called up uh, Penn State and they're like, oh, we decided to go in a different direction. And he's like, holy crap, like I don't, now I don't have a school because I told all these other ones I'm done. Like, what am I gonna do next year? was high school coach was in uh, the Marine Corps during World War II. A guy at Villanova University was his friend who served in the same platoon with him. He called him up and said, hey, I got a guy, can you make this work? He said, yeah, we'll figure out what we can do money-wise, but sent him on over and he went there and he ended up getting into the Villanova Hall of Fame. But basically like the Marine Corps you know, kind of hookup got him taken care of. And he literally trained us like the Marine Corps. I mean, even to the point when we would walk out for games, we would rehearse walking two by two military-wise because he wanted that intimidation and that presence that that kind of brought. So that was kind of basically everything I did uh, growing up. Ended up having a great career in high school, uh, team-wise. I won two state titles. It was three years we're in high school, so I went like 40 and one. Kind of got to the point now I got to decide where I want to go to college. And during my junior year, we're playing in the state playoffs. And the coach for this other team, it was called Central Dolphin, he, I believe he was once the Naval Academy football coach. So I had a decent game and I'm getting letters from the Naval Academy. And I remember how excited my dad was like, oh my God, Naval Academy. And I'm like, like, I wanted nothing to do with the military. I'm like, I just want to go play ball, grow my hair long, drink some beer. If I got time, I'll go to class, you know, type of thing. So I ended up going to the University of Massachusetts and I was playing football there and then woke up one uh, September morning and that's when I saw the World Trade Tower was hit and that kind of forever changed my trajectory in my life. And I think for all of us, that's when we uh, lost our innocence. But again, kind of going back to that high school football and just having, you know, Coach Petten, you know, there's always kind of that thing like, 
you were just thinking football the entire time, like going up in high school. And then you're in college and you kind of start getting a realization like I, I ain't going to the NFL. Like I had to go up against this guy, Brian Westbrook, and he absolutely made me look like an idiot and took off down the field while I'm still on the turf field picking myself up. And I'm like, Brian Buckley's not going to the NFL. Brian Westbrook is going to the NFL and he'll probably end up in the Eagles Hall of Fame. But I'll never forget, you know, Coach Patton, I made a mistake one day and he's coming up to me. And I've kind of leaned my face mask towards him, like, okay, here comes the ass chew. And then he, like, smacked away my face mask. And he's like, I'm not worried about winning games and winning championships. I'm going to do that. What keeps me up at night is what kind of man are you going to be when you leave this program? And it was at kind of that time right before 9-11, I was kind of thinking, like, what kind of man am I going to be? And what am I going to do here with my life? Even though I had, like, three more years of college, it just kind of was getting to that point, And then wham. That September morning, everything changed. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, I was living in an apartment at UMass with four other football players, and I was just the first one up that day. And I go in, turn on the TV, and I see the first tower smoking. And it took me back to 1993 when Al-Qaeda first tried to blow up the World Trade Tower. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, man, I didn't think 93 was that bad. Like, I, I literally thought they were showing a replay of uh, the 1993 incident. So I get a bowl of Cheerios, and I'm sitting down eating it. I get a call from my buddy Dave Armstrong, who's playing football at University of Michigan. And he's kind of like, dude, do you know what's going on? Like, what the heck? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow down. Like, what, what is happening? And he's like, I think we're under attack or something. And then that's when you saw the second plane hit, and you're like okay, something's up here. It was a very kind of strange day, to say the least, for everyone, right? So some of the classes at UMass were going on, some weren't, so you're kind of meandering around campus. We had football practice that night, so we don't really know what's going on, so go down to the football facility. Uh, we had, like, three big screen TVs, and we had, like, those, like, the cubby kind of wooden lockers and stuff like that where you can just kind of hang out. And I think we probably had around, like, a dozen or so guys from New York City. And this is where I age myself. Like, cell phones weren't what they were then, what they are now. Like, we were still pretty much attached to landlines. So no one could call home. These guys are just, I, you can't imagine what they're going through. Like, New York City, they're from New York City. They, don't, they haven't been able to talk to anyone. Our coach walks in, and he's like, okay, guys, why don't we go out and have a quick whiz practice? And that's just put your helmet on, go out and get some fits. And the, one of the captains, Jeremy Robinson, stood up, and he's like, coach, I don't think we practice today. And Coach Whipple, who's the head coach at UMass at the time, is like, okay. Like, he wasn't fighting it at all. He goes, got it. He's like, hey, guys, why don't we go home? We're going to kind of figure out what's going to happen here. Call your loved ones, because obviously you see how fragile life can be. And then he said something that just I'll never forget. He's like, I don't think we're going to play this weekend, because uh, Pete Rozelle, who was the commissioner of the NFL, said his biggest regret as commissioner was playing football the week that Kennedy was killed. And it was just one of the things, like, he said it as I'm walking out of the room, and I'm like, all right, whatever. Like, that was kind of a random fact. We stopped. We got, like, a couple cases of beer, drove back to the apartment, and we got uh, cable uh, news on. And this is when you started seeing people throwing themselves out of the building. And I just remember watching and thinking to myself, how bad of a situation are these people in where they're literally thinking, my best chance is to me to throw my body out of this uh, skyscraper. Next thing you know, this woman jumped out, and she was holding her dress down, and she clearly knew what was going to happen in the end state, but it was just the way she kind of did it was like she was doing it with dignity, doing it on her terms, and that just spoke like America to me. And I know it sounds like hokey and all this stuff, but I was like, I get up, everyone's kind of talking tough how pissed off they were. I go into the bathroom, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, it's time for me to go earn my citizenship. We didn't play that weekend. I ended up getting like a gnarly high ankle sprain because we had a scrimmage and um, kind of had to fight my way back to getting healthy. And next thing you know, things were going and I was playing a lot. I was even starting some games as a, as a redshirt freshman. So everything was feeling good and I had a good trajectory. But in the back of my head, I'm like, I, I got to go do this. Um, I was just that pissed off like a, a friend of mine Eric Mayers lost his brother Noel Mayers it was just like I, I just something I had to go do as we're getting ready to get to uh, winter runs for football I'm down like 10 pounds and I'm running back from campus I'm just putting books in my book bag and stuff and 
the, my roommates are like, dude, what is going on? Like, you know, they're like, usually you're all out for everything. And it doesn't seem like you're really interested in football. And we went out to the bar and I just told them all, I'm like, guys, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to transfer out, uh, go to Villanova University. And I'm going to get, at the time, I wanted to get into the Navy. Finished up the school year and uh, got accepted into ROTC. So from there, they had to send me to Newport, Rhode Island, where I basically had to catch up on two years of ROTC. And then by the time I went to Villanova, I was a junior and uh, kind of went from there. And, you know, one funny thing was I had a buddy who was at the Naval Academy. I remember calling him up like, hey, I think I want to go to Naval Academy. And he's like, oh, my God, that'd be great. He's like, but you got to start over. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you got to start as a freshman, go all the way through. And I was, I was like, oh, I might miss the war. Well, how dumb was that? You know, literally 20 years later, the thing's going on. Funny fact with Villanova and that my buddy who was at the academy told me to do it. One, it was relatively close to where I grew up. But he's like, Villanova has the second most admirals and generals in the fleet behind uh, the Naval Academy. So it's a pretty prestigious program. I mean, you got a lot of CENTCOM commanders went there. So it was actually a really good program to get into. What this was all like when I first got into the military, I think we all kind of do it. You probably like nuke things in your head, like you're seeing Full Metal Jacket and you're like, oh my God, like a Marine's gonna be yelling at me and it's gonna be crazy. So go to Newport, Rhode Island. And it was like one, just a beautiful area, but it was really my first introduction to the military, like getting the uniform, standing in formation, drilling, all that stuff. You know, there is one Marine gunnery sergeant and he's kind of running around doing stuff. And yeah, you catch his attention every now and then, but you're like, oh my God, that was crazy. And you think like, this is nuts. Like we're in the, the thick of it. it. Really in reality, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, it was a great course, went through it. Uh, you learned a lot. Like I so said, you're, you're getting pretty much two years put on you. Really great group of people. Um, and then it was, the funny thing was the commander was a Navy captain. So people know like, for Navy, a captain next rank up is an admiral, so they're really high high up in rank. He was an awesome guy named Conrad Donahue. And we got along great whenever I sat and talked with him. And, you know, my parents come up for graduation. My mom's like, Conrad? And he's like, Connie. And she's like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm the commander of this. And he's like, why are you here? She goes, that's my kid. And he's like, get the heck out of here. And like, his father actually was like a pallbearer at, I think, like my grandmom's funeral and stuff. So it was just like meeting an extension of my family that I didn't even know exist. And we're all still real like close and talk, but it was like of all the gin joints in all the world, I have to walk into where like, I guess he's like my third cousin was the uh, commander of it. Like I say, great course, learned a lot. Really definitely prepared me to get to Villanova and start in the ROTC program. Came back like midsummer. I think I had like another month and then I went to Villanova and started in the ROTC route. And I wanted to be a Navy pilot. But as I started watching the Marines work out more, that just kind of seemed more like my tribe. And I decided, I'm like, I want to go the Marine Corps route. And what was funny was here I am, I'm in Villanova, I'm in the Naval ROTC, I should be good. Like if I want to go Marine Corps, fine. They're like, your SAT scores are too low. I'm like, what? And I just, you know, playing high school, again, high school football, I just did enough to get through the clearinghouse for NCAA, and I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to Harvard. Like, I didn't care about that. And I didn't score a 1,000. I was just a little bit under that, but they're like, the Marine Corps is the only group in the military that requires their officers have a minimum score of 1,000 on their SATs. Like, the Army doesn't care, Navy, Air Force, they don't care, but the Marine Corps does. So I ended up enrolling into Sylvan Learning Center. So it's me. Right now, I'm, like, technically a junior in, or sophomore junior in college. And it's a bunch of 14 year olds in there getting ready for the SATs. And like, I, I was like Billy Madison, like everyone would joke, they would ask me to go buy him cigarettes and stuff like that. And I even think my teacher was younger than me. And I'm just like, listen, I need to get a thousand. I need you to show me how to do this. And she kind of went through how the test is lined up. And like after number 20 in this section, don't answer any more, all that stuff. And ended up getting well over a thousand on it. People are like, were you nervous or feel weird doing that? I'm like, whatever I have to do to succeed, I'm gonna do it. So if that means I have to eat a little humble pie and hang out with 14 year olds so I learn how to take an SAT again while I'm already at Villanova University, so be it. Going into my next year, that's when everything changed. The way ROTC units are set up, you'll have an 06 as a commander. We were Marine kind of centric, so our commander was a Marine Colonel. Then you have an XO, which was Navy commander. And then you're gonna have uh, lieutenants and uh, lieutenants, Navy side teaching, and then you have a major Marine Corps teaching. 
And then you have uh, assistant Marine Corps officer instructor, which is going to be a gunnery sergeant, which was a, they have to be a drill instructor. So a new AMOI checked in named Don Moeller and very intimidating looking guy. I mean, if you had to draw a Marine, you're going to draw this guy. And he was a recon baby. Uh, when he went through boot camp and school of infantry, he tried out for recon, made it, and he spent his entire time at recon, force recon, or special operation training group. So very intense guy. And he knows I want to go to Marine Corps and stuff. And he comes up to me, he's like, you want to go to Marine Corps, right? I'm like, uh, yes, gunnery sergeant. He goes, okay. And he's like, looks at me, he's like, you want to fly? And I'm like, yeah, uh, I do, gunnery sergeant. He goes, that's lame. He's like, no, you need to be on the ground fighting. That, that's where you need to be. And I'm like, okay. And he basically turned our workout program into amphibious reconnaissance school. It was five days a week. We were getting after it, whether it be pool workouts, mat workouts, whatever it was. And I think we actually, as an ROTC, had the highest physical fitness test scores out in the country, averaged out even to the Naval Academy. I mean, if you were not getting a 285, you sucked, the way we kind of looked at it. And for all you guys, you know, 300 is perfect and 285 is a pretty high one. Do all that, get picked. I can go to the Marine Corps. And then that's when he's like, listen, I want you to get into reconnaissance. I'm like, that's what I want to do too. I want to go force recon. He goes, all right. And we just constantly train for that and practice for it. To the point, he even sent me to SEER school. So that's Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape school before I went to any other school in the military. You know, I went up there, did that, and I always tell people, like, ignorance is bliss sometimes, because when I was getting interrogated, I literally knew nothing. And, like, I couldn't give them anything. Like, if I could have, I would have. And I'm like, dude, I know nothing about the military at this point. So I go through Sears school, and then I had to check into the basic school. And what the basic school is, I do believe the Marine Corps does it right. It doesn't matter if you're gonna be a lawyer, candlestick maker, grunt, whatever it is, Every Marine officer has to go to the basic school for six months. The goal is that all of you are, have the ability to be an infantry rifle platoon commander, or like basically at that point. But you're also competing. So once you get through TBS, you, you put in what you want to do for your military occupation specialty, but doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. And, you know, kind of to backtrack, while you're at Villanova or doing ROTC, the summer before your senior year, you have to go to officer candidate school. And what we had to do is it's called the bulldog version. So it's like, I think it's like six or eight weeks, but there is no time off. I mean, you're running from a test to some physical fitness thing, whatever it may be. Hopefully you can grab a couple hours of sleep at night. It was really intense. So, you know, I'm looking at that thing what I did on uh, Newport. And I'll never forget the gunnery sergeant there. He goes, if you go officer candidate school, he's just telling all of us in the Marine Corps, he's like, this is what we did here, but on like super steroids, like it's totally different. And the difference with officer candidate school versus boot camp, they're not trying to make you into a Marine. They want to see if you have what it takes to lead a Marine. So it's a tryout. And if they don't like you or it's not working out, you're gone. It was crazy because I'm driving down to Quantico and just feeling like soreness in my neck. And I'm thinking like, oh man, maybe I'm just stressed out or something. And we're standing in line, we're getting processed in, and like a couple people are like passing out and falling down. And I'm like, maybe I'm just supposed to feel this way. Like, I don't know, I just feel like crap. You know, I could run three miles, I could do it in 19 minutes and not think twice about it. Like, that wasn't hard, like, you know. But I'm really struggling in my physical fitness events. And like, my nose is bleeding, I'm trying to hide it out. I'm like, man, I don't know what is going on with me. Coughing all the time, I'm just feeling terrible. And so I just kind of power my way through OCS and it's like towards the end, we're about to graduate. You know, we did all our final tests, like we're in. They sent me to BAS and I get checked out and they're like, yeah, your one lung is completely like useless right now. It's just full of mucus. And they're like, just sit on your on the bench, you're done. And I'm like, no, no, I can't leave. They're like, you're not gonna get kicked out. You're fine. Like you just, you just gotta chill out. So I'm like, okay, go through, graduate. Go back to Doylestown, Pennsylvania. I'm coaching high school football. So if anyone's been out on the East Coast, you know, it's August, like humidity, it just feels like crap. I'm on the sideline, like shivering, and I'm just like not feeling good at all. And it went to the point, like I was basically in bed all weekend, and I loved going out with my friends and doing all that. So my parents were like, something's wrong here. So they take me to the emergency room, go in, get all these tests done, and they walk in, they're like, what have you been doing over the past couple of months? And I'm like, Oh, I've been an officer candidate school in Quantico, Virginia. And they're like, 
okay, you have mono and pneumonia, and, like, your one lung is completely, like, shut down, basically, and they're like, please say you have not been drinking. I'm like, drank like a fish when I got back. They're like, well, no more, because you have liver spots and all that stuff. So I was pretty banged up, and it was basically a month of no working out and just recovering. Uh, but again, that's how bad I wanted to get there, and I be damned mono and pneumonia. Like, I was going to push my way through, but, yeah, I got through officer candidate school and then went to the basic school and was there for uh, six months. I had a fun time. I mean, it was definitely kind of like a, a pain in the ass course, but there's just like a really good group of guys that I, I got to meet and still talk with them to this day. And and we got to go up into Washington, D.C. on the weekends, and I, I had fun doing that. But I remember like one of the stories, we're doing our land nav course, and we're on a place called Camp Barrett. And they have this one like kind of gravel road trail that's exactly one mile long and goes right to the FBI Academy. And I think it's called like Candidates Trail or something like that. And the way you would work on land app that I found to be the most efficient was run the mile up towards the, Navy, uh, towards the FBI Academy and then find your point and hit your box up there and start making your way back down, let's just say south, down to Camp Barrett. So that way when you're done, you're not running a mile back to make sure you make the time. Like you're literally right where you need to be. And it was just a real, really, really hot, humid day. And we get our brief. And they're like, all right, and this LZ is going to be a water bowl. And that LZ is going to be a water bowl. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to just go run all the way north to that water bowl, refill my camel pack, and then make my way down south. So I'm not really thinking about taking care of my water. Of like, you know, only take a little bit what you need. I'm like, I got Pedialyte in there. I'm like, just pound that thing, get that thing in your in your system, and then make your way back south with a fresh uh, pouch, and you're going to be good. I ended up in this LZ. And during land nav, you're not supposed to talk to anyone. So to kind of walk out, I'm like in the LZ, and you're just looking for this big water bowl that is not there. And then there's like six more lieutenants kind of emerge from the woods, and we're all kind of like doing this to each other. And we're like, I don't know. So we, we I mean, I guess we did a, a violation. We talked. We're like, did anyone see that thing? And it's like, no. And one guy's like, dude, I'm completely out. And we're like, crap. So we all just spread load our water, be like, all right, man, high five, good luck to everyone. And we'd all just ran back in the tree line. So I'm hemming and hawing, and man, like my left calf is cramping so bad. And I found nine points. I had one more, but I'm like, I mean, you would only think it's one more point, but I am hurting. And I'm like, dude, I can't move my leg. I mean, you can, for me, when like I'm about to black out, I can kind of like hear myself breathe and like the walls of the world are kind of closing in. I'm like, Phew. so I'm like, man, I am just so thirsty. So I just walked out to the road and next thing you know, a Humvee's driving by and they like, it was like two enlisted guys look at me and they're like, like stop and they turn back around. They're like, Lieutenant, get into the vehicle. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm still in heaven. And they're like, Lieutenant, it's over. Just get into the vehicle with us. And I'm like, Oh, okay, like, and I'm sure you said a couple other things because you're always like, "What? How are you trying to screw me over and stuff?" Just sit in the back. I remember I'm punching my calf. I'm like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, "This is killing me." I'm like, "Do you guys got any water?" And they throw me some water, and I hear them talking to each other. They're like, "Oh, this is really fucked up. This is bad. This isn't good." And I'm like, "Guys, what is going on?" They're like, "There is literally a mass casualty of uh, exercise going on down at Camp Barrett." And I'm like, "What?" It's like, yeah, everyone started passing out. Um, Basically, like you have like ambulance in there, like news reporters, the whole nine. So we get down there and they're like, oh, like, are you OK? I'm like, yeah, it's just my calf. And they're like, do you need an IV? I'm like, no. I'm like, because I did not want to get like he casually put it in my record book. I'm like, that could screw me up for the infantry. Like, I'm just trying to muscle this thing out. And eventually there's like no questions asked. They're like, if anyone has anything you're going in to get checked out, that's it. And at this time, General Mattis, he was a three star. And if people know General Mass, he, he's the real deal. I mean, he loves the Marine Corps. He loves Marines. And he's a hard motherfucker. Um, but he's a very fair guy, in my opinion. And <clears throat> I guess he was up in D.C. at something. And he gets word what's going on, and he shows up. So it's like all this stuff's going on, all this craziness. I just remember when Mattis showed up, it was like, oh, God. Like, everyone got quiet. They were trying to say, not General Mattis, some other officers were trying to say, like, we did not prepare our bodies for this or anything. And Mattis was like, that's bullshit. You guys briefed where the water bowl should be. They weren't there. That's a failure on you guys. Don't hold the lieutenants on that one, all that stuff. So everything was fine. Like, we were all kind of taken care of. But, I mean, I had a really good friend who was a prior enlisted force recon guy, and he ended up, like, they found him naked, like, in a stream. Like, he just took off all his stuff. Like, and he doesn't even remember it. So, I mean, it was that crazy, but yeah, they just forgot that one water bowl.
And like, I mean, 100 lieutenants like went down. The way we do it in TBS is you'll pick like your top five. MOS is what you want to do. And you got like a platoon commander who's a captain. He kind of like he advises you and all that stuff. But I mean, I everyone knew from Jump Street I want to go in the infantry. I mean, I haven't been that obsessed like that since like I was talking about the high school football days. Like, gotta gotta start for that team. I'm like, I gotta get in the infantry. I don't care what I'm gonna do. It's kind of a weird tier ranking they try to do because they want to spread low talent. So they'll have like tier one, tier two, tier three, and you might be number one in tier one. And then the second best guy will be number one in tier two. And then the third best guy will be number one in tier three. And that's kind of a spread load. And sometimes people just end up getting screwed over. Like they just have no desire to do what they got picked for. Our uh, officers are pretty good about it where they're like, we're going to do whatever we can to get you a top three. Like, because you guys, at the end of the day, you got to be happy doing what you're doing. And it's good for us too, because we get to retain you later and so on and so forth. We all go meet with our uh, platoon commander and they're gonna give us our MOSs this one night. And you're like, oh my God, everyone's nervous all day. And they're going through giving them. And then they said like, you know, Lieutenant Buckley, like 89, 21. And I'm like, what the hell? And like, everyone's like, oh, no way. And he's like, I'm just messing with you, man. 0302, like you're going. I'm like, woo, you know, all fired up. Infantry officer course is right across the street from the basic school. So I literally didn't have to go anywhere. Um, we got orders. They actually pulled us out of the basic school a little bit early to start infantry officer course. And this would have been in 2005 time frame. And this was when, like, you know, we're a two front war. We had a lot going on. So we had like 50 of us, I think, went into infantry officer course. They just kind of had to get us going pretty quick. So a hands down infantry officer course was the best course I ever went through in the Marine Corps. You know, as you're going through the basic school, you're obviously a second lieutenant, your platoon commanders are captains and your company commander's a major. And you're not really interacting too much with your platoon commander or like captains. It's a little bit of like, you know, kind of hesitancy. Then you see majors like, oh, no way, like get away from me type of thing. So when we went to infantry officer course, these guys were like heroes to all of us. I mean, they just, these guys all got through the push in Iraq. Most of them did uh, Operation Phantom Fury, which was the takedown of Fallujah in 2004. And I mean, guys had Navy crosses and bronze stars and all this stuff. And you're like, wow, these guys are like incredible. And my mentor was a guy named uh, Captain Brian Shantosh. And Shantosh was awarded Navy Cross, which is one medal behind the Medal of Honor, during the push in Iraq. He was a cat platoon commander, so basically these guys would go try to find mechanized vehicles and attack them, like tanks and stuff like that. And he got caught up in like kind of like a complex ambush, and he just told his driver to basically drive into like a trench system and they drive into that. He jumps out and he's chasing these Iraqi army guys like down the wadi shooting at him. Next thing you know, he grabs an AK, keeps shooting them. Then next thing you know, he grabs an RPG and shoots more. And it's like, if you read this thing, it's like during his attack, he cleared 200 meters of enemy territory single-handedly. And you're like, how is this not the Medal of Honor? Like, it's insane. But yeah, guys like that. And they were like, listen, we kind of have to like un-TBS you guys because you're gonna be a platoon commander in the infantry, I'm a company commander in the infantry, we have to talk. And like, you need to tell us things respectfully if it's not gonna work, like we just gotta build that rapport. So they did a really great job of kind of breaking that stuff down. And then the way we learned, it was so, I mean, lack of better words, it's cool. Like they would teach us, and I don't wanna go into too many details because I don't know how much they still use this in infantry officer course, and I do think some of it has to remain kind of quiet because you would not learn as much but just the things that we went through and did in that course it was incredible i mean you learned a lot about yourself you felt extremely confident going into the fleet i mean the last exercise we do is we go into 29 palms we're there for two weeks and we go up to bridgeport and we're up there for two weeks you're dealing with every asset the marine corps infantry will have i mean you just you just feel very dialed in now we were an east coast heavy class so that's where um, a majority of us are going to end up going to Camp Lejeune, and a couple of the guys ended up out in Camp Pendleton. So I got orders. First orders were 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. So they're bringing that battalion back from Vietnam. They were like the Walking Dead Battalion. So we're all thinking, oh, kind of cool. The next thing you know, they said, no, you're not going to 1-9. We're going to say to 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines. And I'm like, oh, man, that, you know, 1-9, that would have been kind of cool. And I'll never forget 
Sean Tosh is like, no, would not. Like, one nine's not going to deploy for a while. Like, two eight, they're going to get going. They're already in the business. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, didn't really think about that. They wanted us down. We were supposed to check in at the end of January of 2006, but the battalion commander wanted us in there early. So I think I checked in on like the 3rd or 4th of January. The battalion commander, uh, I'm still friends with them, and he helps out with Battle Brothers, named uh, Colonel Ken DeTrue. But he grew up in the Philadelphia area. I believe graduated from Temple. Diehard Philadelphia sports fan like myself. So me and him automatically just started jiving. And I was extremely fortunate. My company commander is a guy named Gus Mingus. He was force recon, scout sniper, drill instructor. And I think he was in his like 19th year in the Marine Corps. So he was like pretty legendary within the captain's ranks. And he took a liking to me, you know, I worked hard, trained hard, and he really opened up a lot of opportunities for me when we did our first deployment to Fallujah, Iraq, which ultimately got me to where I ended up today. He would do some really, really outside the box stuff with me and encourage that. And I think that really helped develop me better as a Marine officer. Like, I think all of our platoon sergeants were out of some course or whatever. It's the first time we're going out to the field. So all the lieutenants were running around with like our heads cut off. I mean, it's like raining outside. Guys are supposed to be there like zero nine waiting in formation. It's like 930. We're still running around trying to unfuck things. And Mingus comes in and he's like, what the hell are you guys doing? And we're like, oh, and he's like, stop, look outside. All those guys are standing in the rain because you're dumbasses. Like never do that to your Marines ever again. Like go out, tell them to go away. You guys get your shit figured out. You work for them, they don't work for you. And it was just kind of one of those like good indicators of like, this is how you got to work and treat your Marines and take care of them and not just be an idiot, essentially. So I think it really advanced us. Deployment to Fallujah with 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, basically going into like firm base operations. So we set up this place called uh, OP Viking, which was just northwest of Fallujah proper. You know, we were just getting hit by a lot of mortar rounds, a lot of IEDs were going on, a little bit of small arms stuff here and there. We didn't lose anyone in that deployment. You know, we had some casualties, but we took out some pretty good rings. Probably one of the more bigger ones we did was this one uh, terrorist named Hamid Romano or something like this. Hamid the Grenade or something they called him. He was kind of becoming like a ghost. You know, everyone, like every unit briefed him when you're doing your uh, turnover. It's like, this is a guy kind of running the cells out here and no one could find him. And next thing you know, it's like just another day. We got one platoon out. We get a frago. Hey, Hamid Romano's at this area. So the one platoon goes out there. And then they're like, Hamid Romano's now in this area, get someone out there. So we send the QRF out there. And so each platoon is kind of stepping up now, like, okay, now I'll be the QRF. So I think another platoon's out there and we broke down into four platoons because of the counterinsurgency. Like typically infantry companies have uh, three rifle platoons and a weapons platoon. We spread load the weapons platoon guys and had four platoons just so we could be a little bit more foot mobile. And next thing you know, the XO turns to me, he goes, hey, here you go, and hands me like kind of a little file. He goes, this one seems pretty legit. So I'm like, well, let's go and get my guys. And we drive, going all through all these kind of crazy areas in, uh, in the Fallujah area. And we end up at this like huge compound and walk in. And it was like, I think they're either having a birthday or something like that, but it was a lot of people. So we just basically cordon everything off, no one in, no one out and just kind of walking through and seeing who had IDs. So now we have a picture of this guy in this dossier of like what he looks like. And going through and I'm asking for IDs. And typically the way I would say a lot of like kind of the Arab culture is, you know, say that like people are sitting in a U shape, it'll be the person in the middle is kind of like the important one. And they kind of spread out that way. So I'm going towards the guy in the middle and I'm like, hey, your ID. And he's just like acting dumb. And I'm like, no ID. And he's like, and I just pulled up his man dress and I looked and I saw the ID right by his foot. And I'm like, so I grabbed it and I put it next to the picture that I have. It is exactly identical. Like it was him. So like now I'm like trying not to get too excited. I'm like, okay, we'll see who else we got. Like kind of playing it off. And I'm like, all right. And just kind of kept everything there. Grabbed my uh, couple squad leaders. I'm like, get that guy and we're going to grip him up and we got to isolate him from everyone else because that's Hamid Romano right there. Call up the hire, let them know. Now my battalion's getting spun up. So we got that all locked down. And next thing you know, it's like my company commander's trying to come out. Like Gus is trying to find me. Like, I mean, we were in a weird spot. Like I'm shooting pop-ups, like just try to get to my area. 
bring them in, the battalion comes in, we have aircraft all over the place, all the intel, all the MPs, everyone's showing up. And I mean, we were there all night through the morning just getting all these guys off. But that was a kind of a big win and that was relatively early in our deployment. They thought so highly of us, we were doing combined raids with the SEALs. So they were hitting guys right down in Fallujah, uh, the center city type area. We were hitting things up north in the farm area. And it was just going great. Um, and that's when I came back, feel really good, loving what I was doing. And they said, hey, we're going to give you your shot. We're going to let you go try out for recon. Typically, what you have to do is spend two years in that infantry company. So typically, you would be a platoon commander. Then you're going to be an EXO somewhere within the battalion. They're like, if you make it, we'll cut your orders early and let you leave and go be a platoon commander in recon, which I'm like, here we go. And uh, so I tried out for recon, made it, and they kicked me orders right over there. So while the rest of my friends were becoming like XOs and like kind of pissed off, I'm like, dude, I got another command and I'm over at recon. So that was pretty fun. They basically said like infantry officer course or like if you do that, like it's just, you just need the AMFIB package. So like we'll do the AMFIB with you. And again, I tell people like, we were recalling people at this point. Like, I'll never forget driving by a huge field on Camp Lejeune, and you're just seeing all these former Marines getting in process because they got recalled and they're going back in. So things were like kind of hot and heavy. We don't have enough officers trying out for recon. Like, we need platoon commanders. And the colonel at Second Recon, uh, Colonel Jimmy Bright, him and Colonel Kenda True were close friends, who was my battalion commander, 28. And he basically called up Ken's, like, Ken, you got any studs? And he's like, I got a guy who really wants to do it. And he's like, get him up here. Let's try him out. If he makes it, we'll bring him in. And that's what happened. So they're like, hey, don't worry about BRC. We can do that later. We'll do AMFIB stuff here. We're not really worried about AMFIB, to be honest with you, because we're going to Iraq. Checked into my platoon. I was in Charlie Company and had a third platoon. And it was great because when the MARSOC flag went up, the force recon flag came down, right? But part of the drug deal what, with the Marine Corps was they get to keep one force platoon on the East Coast and one force platoon on the West Coast. So my platoon was the force recon platoon. So I had all staff sergeants and gunnery sergeants just like, just pipe hitting dudes. And I was the most junior officer because usually the platoon commander would be a captain. I was a first lieutenant, but I had an amazing platoon sergeant, Kenny, uh, Kenny Urquhart. I mean, I'm still, he got out as a master of guns, still very close with him today. And even all the uh, team leaders in recon, I'm still close with all them today. And that was just such a great group of guys. And we went into Iraq and this one is when it was very like, interesting. And I don't think this gets enough credit. No one talks about the brilliance of how things turned around after we did the surge in 2006. The ironic part, and this is where I talk about butterfly effects, like how close things went to where my life would have went a totally different trajectory. It was 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines and 1st Battalion, 6th Marines. And it was a coin toss who was going to get extended. And that was going to be the start of the surge and we're going to start bringing more units. 2-8 won the coin toss, so we got to go home. 1-6 had to stay. Now, if we would have lost, I would have stayed for another three months but I probably, I don't know if I'd ever was snelled recon. So we come back and six months, do work up for six months, I'm right back over in Iraq, right in Fallujah. And I'm, now I'm working for the MEF. So we were kind of quasi force recon asset and we were all over Al Anbar. But I remember leaving in 2-8 and I'm like, ah, man, I don't know what we're doing here. Like, if this is gonna work, it just seems like kind of like whack-a-mole. Like we take care of that, something pops up, we go take care of that, that pops up. It's just never gonna end. Well, when I got back there, it was so boring in a good way. Like nothing was happening. The surge worked. They call it the Al Ambar awakening. Basically all the sheikhs and the imams got together and said, not really thrilled about these US Marines, but these Al Qaeda guys are a pain in the ass. Uh, that's when Al Zakari was still around. He was the uh, Al Qaeda leader in Iraq. And he was just a ruthless thug murderer. I mean. He wasn't fighting his jihad or anything like that. He, it was like a mafia boss. Like, if you got in his way, he was going to kill you. So he was killing a lot of Iraqis, Muslims, all that. Um, so that's when they all just stood up, said enough, and kind of kicked them out of the uh, Ramadi and Fallujah where they didn't have all that, you know, kind of murder intimidation campaigns they could do. And eventually what happened during that was we were just doing kind of very sniper hide stuff, nothing too high impact to then working with the SEALs, and we were just basically driving the herd up to Kurdistan with the Kurds, where they're like, bring them to us, and we'll figure this one out. 
And so we just started pushing far up north into Iraq. And again, just another amazing group of guys, no casualties, not a lot of gunfights in this one. But we did we did some really great stuff I can't get too much into, but it was uh, just a blast. Then I come back from that, and it's like, well, what am I going to do next? And they were going to make me an XO. MARSOC was kind of revved up. I'm like, man, I'm a senior first lieutenant. This is kind of the sweet spot for me to go try out for selection. And that's what I wanted to do. And my battalion commander brought me in, and he's like, listen, we're standing back up Force Recon, and I want you to be one of the platoon commanders. I'm like, great. I'm like, can I get the first platoon out to go to Afghanistan? He goes, no. He's like, this other captain, he has not deployed in like two years. Like, he needs to go. Like, he's going first. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. And he's like, come on, man. It's Force Recon. You always want to do that. You didn't join the Marine Corps to get into a MARSOC. And I'm like, well, it's like, sir, with all due respect, I'm like, if you look at our recruiting videos, you got Marines running over a bridge uh, with lava underneath of it. They pull out a sword, they fight a dragon, and then they turn into a Marine. I'm like, those are the type of people you're recruiting. Like, you guys, we, you want the people who want to go seek action and do this stuff. I want to see how far the rabbit hole can go. So I want to see what's over there in Marsoc and test my abilities, and they're still Marines. And he's like, all right, that was a good pitch. I'll let you go uh, try out. If you make it, I'll cut you orders. Like, I still put out another year at recon. He gave me a good deal, and they were insanely supportive of what I was doing. To get my body right for selection, I was... Six months clean and sober. I was getting eight hours of sleep. I was working out twice a day, six days a week. So in the morning time, I'd do a ruck run or a hike up on Tank Trail up there by Courthouse Bay. And then the evenings would usually be like some sort of lift or whatever uh, I wanted to do at that point. My feet were insanely strong. Like anytime I got a blister, popped it, did a little benzoin treatment. Um, I was also using, for everyone at home, bag bomb. If you're ever doing some long endurance anything, bag bomb is made for cow udders, you know, so when they're milking them, they don't want to chafe them. So they rub this stuff on it and it hardens them up. So I put that all over my feet. It was amazing. Never got a blister again. So I'm ready to go. I was just training so hard. I just need like a weekend before I was going to selection. I'm like, I'm just going to go back to my parents' house and just kind of chill out. And while I was back there, unfortunately, my grandma became very ill and ended up in hospice and it wasn't looking too good. And I just remember looking at my dad, like, what do you want me to do? And he's like, you're going to selection. And he's like, you can't do anything about this. And I'm like, well, you know, he goes, nope, your body's primed. You're training for it. Go. And I went, all right. So uh, went, checked into selection. And then they hit us with all these kind of, you're getting Wonderlick exams and IQ exams and psychological exams. And they literally, it's amazing how fast they start weeding people out. Until at one point they say, hey, turn your cell phone in, turn your wallet in. They take your name tape off and they send you to an undisclosed undis location and you start going through the selection process, which uh, was pretty good. I think what was probably the most challenging part for selection is physically my body was good. You know, I'm sure this thing has changed up so much since I've been there, but you would do an, do an unknown hike relatively early and it's in the middle of the night. They're not going to tell you how far to go. You don't know what your timeline is. You're kind of just on your own. But I smoked it. Like, I mean, I basically what I would do is walk up the hills, run down the hills, and then recon shuffle on the, on the flat lands and just boogie. Like everything, it pays to be a winner. You get thrown in the van, they take you back to the hut. You go back and shower and get some sleep, and you just hear the door opening all throughout the night of guys finally coming back in. To the point, like, one guy came in, was like, oh, thank God, and put down his ruck, and they came in, like, lights, let's go. And, like, we're going to say that dude was not happy. You know, what I tell people, what makes it difficult, and the best advice I can give you, is think about Forrest Gump. You know, Forrest Gump obviously had some issues. Uh, probably not the brightest guy in the world. But if you remember when he went through boot camp, the drill uh, sergeant's like, you're going to be a general one day. Like, he was killing it because he was keeping everything simple. Like, if you're telling Forrest Gump to clean the latrine floors, that's all he worried about. If you're telling him to uh, disassemble, reassemble a, a rifle, that's all he worried about. He wasn't thinking of what might happen next. And it's really easy in selection to have that because they're not talking to you. They're very stoic. The instructors don't yell. They're not gonna show emotion, which to me made it worse because someone's like yelling at you, getting on you, you're kind of gonna pick it up. But all we got instructions was from a whiteboard or cones. 
It would just be something written, and you had to interpret it the best you can. And so I always tell people, like, don't overthink things. If you literally are saying, hey, you guys got to do push-ups, think about doing the best push-ups in the world, and that's it. I actually had to kind of relieve uh, a guy during the team phase. Um, so you do a lot of individual stuff, and then next thing you know, you show up, and now you're doing team things. And again, you have no idea what's happening. And the exercises weren't that bad. It was just a lot of problem solving. But you know, we're doing, we're coming back when we had a land nav some way, but I'm not even gonna say this was like a hard land nav. It was pretty much like stick on the road and you get to the point. And the one guy who was a team leader and I was the assistant team leader, he just started going internal. Like he just wasn't making sense. He was just getting frustrated. And I just walk up, I'm like, dude, let me see this map. And I'm like, I got this. I'm gonna get us back home. Like, this is getting ridiculous. And the cadre walks up to me and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna take it from here. And they're like, can you get us home? I'm like, I'll get us home. They're like, all right. And I've realized we're making really good time. And you don't know, they don't set up times for you to eat. Like you can eat when you have to. So I'm like, ah, this might be a little brazen, but I'm just gonna do it. And I brought everyone in. I'm like, hey, let's go security, 50% on, 50% off. I'm like, you know, twos, you eat your food first. Ones, you're on security. Twos, when you're done, ones eat, two, you provide security. And just put everyone in a tree line. And the cadre came up to me and like, what are you doing? I'm like, giving them some chow. And he's, they're like, is this the appropriate thing to be doing? I'm like, yes. And they're like, okay. And he like walked away. So all the guys got fired up. Like they're like, hell yeah, man, we got to eat some food and stuff. I remember a couple of guys, they ended up quitting. So I think they just got too wrapped up and stuff. And you never knew. You'd just come back to the uh, to the hut and there would just be mattresses missing. And that candy was gone. I think one of my favorite memories was with a guy who's still in, Colonel Bill Lombardo. And Bill was a captain. I was a lieutenant going through. Basically, you kind of knew things were figured out, right? Like, I mean, listen, and they're, they're recording everything. They got cameras and voice recorders, and they are listening, trust me. But eventually, we're getting guys called out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the hut, and they're just disappearing, and you don't see them again. And you get a message on the whiteboard, like, go into the chat hall and eat food. It's like, okay, you go in there and you eat your food. It's like, go back to your room and, and read this. And you go back there and you're reading. And then it's like, go to the chow hall and get food. So we're just like, okay. Like, they're putting all their notes together and shit like that. And one by one, guys are disappearing. So Bill and I are like the last two. And we had this little alarm clock radio. And we're like, dude, like, this is like, I wonder what day it is. Like, we have no idea. So we kind of splice the wires and we're hanging out the window. And I pick up a... Uh, they were still called the Washington Redskins at this time, but it was a Redskins Cowboys game. And we're like, oh, it must be Sunday. You know, it's like you got that game going on. And we're just laughing because they're doing the post game stuff and talking. The instructors walk in and they're like, candidate 016, which was me. And they're like, report. And I'm like, 016 reporting. They're like, follow us. And they put me into like a white vehicle, the van's all blacked out. And what I later found out, they were just pretty much doing donuts in like the parking lot. Like, I mean, it's amazing how little situational awareness you have where you are. Like, cause after you make it and they show you everything, you're like, oh my God, but it, you're totally lost kind of what's happening. So we're just driving in circles. They pop me out. They're like, follow us, uh, candidate. And I walk in and they're like, walk me down towards these two doors. I just never forget. They're like, hey, knock on the door and they're going to tell you to come in and report. I'm like, okay. And the guy was a staff sergeant. I'm like, listen, staff sergeant, I don't know if this is against protocol. But I just want to say, like, thank you. I'm like, this was an amazing course. And selection was awesome. I mean, the way they taught you how to land nav, it was just a great course. Even if I didn't make it, it would just been worth going through it just because I learned so much more about myself and I think how to be a better Marine. And I kind of felt good at this point because the staff sergeant looked at me and he goes, and first time he called me a sir, he's like, sir, I think you're going to be all right. And just kind of smiled. And I'm like, oh. Huh. So knocking on the door, they're like, report. And you walk in and it's like stadium seating. And you have like sergeant majors and uh, like a lot of master guns. And a lot of the guys I knew was a lot of recon guys. And one of my friends, uh, Chad Ramsey, he was, I think, a master sergeant at the time, but he ended up getting out some master guns. I just kind of like looked around. And I looked up at him and he's in the back and he has like a big smile. And he's like that to me. And I'm like, all right. And uh, they asked me a question, kind of like a softball question. And, and then they asked me about the one candidate I placed when I just said, hey, I'm firing you. And you need to do, like, you peer people out every night. So we'll say, hey, top three guys you want to go work with, last three guys you want to go work with. So I kept putting this guy down, and then I wrote, saying, this candidate's not only the last Marine I'd ever want to be in a firefight with, he's the last human being I'd want to be in a firefight with. I'm like, he will get someone killed. And they're like, you said about Canada, number, number. 
X, Y, and I start shaking my head. Or you know what I'm going to say? I'm like, yes, sir, Mayor, I know what you're about to say. And it's like, you really think he's the last human being you ever want to be in a gunfight with? I'm like, yeah, yes, sir, Major. He goes, would you say it to his face? I'm like, bring him in right now. And they're like, good enough, like that, whatever. And they're like, okay. They're like, we're done with you. Go back outside. So I just walk out, close the doors, and the staff sergeant walks up to me. He's like, turn back around, knock on the door. I'm like, okay, turn around, knock on. They're like, come in. And then they all stand at like the position of attention. They're like, congratulations, you've been selected to serve in special operations. And you're just like, try not to like lose your shit, you know? But I'm like, being all cool, I'm like, yes, that's great. They're like, okay, congratulations. They all come to shake your hand. And they're like, go outside. They're gonna show you where the chow hall is and all that. And I walk outside and like, that guy, Chad Ramsey, they, they were breaking for lunch. He comes down, just like jumped on my back and he's like, not a doubt in the mind, man, because they brief you on like your abilities and then the, the doctors come in and brief you about your psycho psychological information. And it was great. They're like, oh yeah, go here, there's food and stuff. And you're just like, holy shit. And uh, it was just like really cool. Not a lot of us made it, but a really good group of guys. And we just kind of hung out all night watching TV and just eating some food. We got to ask questions about selection, why they did what they did. And it's really dialed in. I mean, they're like, we went to BUDS, Special Forces, CAG, Team Six, all everyone. We even went to the NFL. And we're like, why do you guys do what you do during your combine? And they're like, and we made a hybrid. And we're like, yeah, we're not like freaking out, yelling at you guys, but we're doing enough that we can figure out if you guys can make it through. And even when we're feeding you guys pretty well, we know at a certain point you guys are like a horse. You'll just keep going until you break. Well, we don't want to necessarily break you. So if we can get you some food and let you go, we can figure things out. So it was pretty crazy, the science behind it. But definitely another great course I, I had the opportunity to go through. Checking in Marsoc, yet again, another moment where I don't know how life would have been different. So, you know, I come back from selection and the battalion commander from recon, he just checked out. And he was gone, so they had a new battalion commander. Now, the way it would work is if they let me go, that's kind of like recon decide to let me go. It doesn't necessarily mean the Marine Corps needs to backfill another officer for them. So there was a little controversy with that. I'm like, okay, what the heck? Stash me in the three shop. I'm working as the assistant operations officer. And we get word that the Marine Corps is going to go into the Helmand province. And so they're thinking they're going to deploy the uh, recon battalion. And so the new battalion commander looked at me, he's like, you're not going anywhere. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be like a three alpha on a deployment. I'm like, I can't believe this. And eventually gets dwindled down to only a debt is gonna go for recon. So they're gonna have, I think like one company with three or four platoons and like a little bit of a leadership detachment, which the operations officer was gonna be like the highest ranking guy as a major. So we come out to 29 Palms, we're doing our work, like our final training which was insane because the infantry units and light armor reconnaissance, they have a whole thing called Mojave Viper, like set up made for them. I did that when I was in 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines. We showed up at recon, like we just kind of showed up and to see if anyone had any work for us. Like there was nothing planned, there was no ranges, like we were literally in jail. Like it was so hot, we just stayed in our huts all day. We'd come out at nighttime and kick some rocks and talk. So my platoon sergeant and I would just get in the vehicle driver to the uh, main side of base and just what ranges are open. Like we were just gonna buy whatever we could to get some training going. And I remember the battalion commander kind of kept it open here. Like usually when you do your first brief and you talk about drinking at 29 Palms on Camp Wilson, it's like, you're gonna have a warrior night and they'll bring in some beer and let you do it. Besides that, no alcohol. This was one of those things like, well, if you push up the chain of command, we, you know, we maybe can go get some drinks and stuff. And I'm like, ooh, that's a little bit ambiguous. So at this point, we're driving. I'm with my uh, friend who's Master Guns, Carl Froisey. We're driving people to the airport because people had to jump on a couple of flights to go out to Afghanistan kind of early to check things out for a pre-deployment site survey. And when we come back, I remember I was a seat of battalion commander and he's like, Captain Buckley, I need a moment with my master gunnery sergeant. I'm like, yes, sir. And I just kind of walked away. Well, it turns out one of the platoon commanders decided to have a little drinking party and he gets beer there. They leave an M249 saw unaccounted for like right outside the hut. And of all the people to walk by, it's a battalion commander. So he picks up this 249 saw and opens up the door and there's a bunch of Marines there drinking. And I guess the platoon commander is like, hey, sir, would you like a beer? And he's like, no, but I'd like to talk to you. And it wasn't good, right? As you could imagine. So they're going to relieve that platoon commander. I'm dropping the operations officer off at the airport. And, I, you know, we kind of know what's going on, but I don't know everything that's going on. 
And he just goes, you know, you're going to have something to think about when you get back. And I'm like, okay. And when I got back, they said, hey, we'd like you to take that guy's platoon into Afghanistan um, in the next couple of weeks. And I thought about it, went back and forth, and I talked to the sergeant major and the master guns, and they're like, listen, you got orders to MARSOC, or we can get your orders to MARSOC, you got to go. And it's like, and part of the deal was if the battalion didn't leave, then you got orders. So let us do our thing, we're gonna help you out. So two E9s are the ones who made it happen for me. And I get orders and I stayed on the East Coast. I never know what would happen. Marja, that was a really tough deployment for those guys. Like Marja was like the city of Fallujah taking that thing down. Lost a lot of good guys. So that's one of those things like decision point. I don't know if I would have made it through that deployment. And then I definitely would have probably wound up on the East Coast for the rest of my career. So go on Marsoc on the East Coast doing some deployments into Africa and Southeast Asia. To me, what was very interesting was, you really, you're kind of alone and unafraid. I mean, you got your team, but you're working with ambassadors and kind of high-level people and stuff. And sometimes you're just wearing a business suit, sometimes you're in your full battle rattle, and sometimes you're doing things in between. So it was very interesting, some of the things that we were doing on that side. But ultimately, you know, we all knew Afghanistan was the Super Bowl, and we knew the Helmand was where the, like, the heavy fighting was going. So. That's where I wanted to be. I got word that I was going to be the uh, close quarter battle uh, officer in charge uh, over at the schoolhouse. So we had a, one of the colonels, um, basically the whole goal with this colonel was not to get kicked out of his office. Like he was just murdering team commanders or captains like left and right. And I go in, I'm meeting with them and good guy. And he's like, okay, they're real excited about getting you over to the schoolhouse. You know, this could be good. And I think he knew more than I thought he knew. And he's like, well, what, what do you want to do? And I'm like, sir, whatever you guys want, I'll go to the schoolhouse, can't wait. You know, he's like, okay. And he's like, no, seriously, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I I'll do what you're asking. He goes, damn it. He goes, I know you'll do what I'm telling you to do. And I appreciate that. He's like, what perfect scenario, what would you be able to do if you, if you had a pick? And I'm like, I want to go over to Hellman. I want to get, go uh, fight over there. And he's like, and I kind of like burst it. Like I just I was like, oh, I just want to go fight in Hellman, you know, kind of thing. And he's like, okay. That's very reasonable. What were you thinking? And I'm like, well, my old ops officer, he was now the battalion commander at 3-8. He wanted me to come over and take one of the companies. I'm like, I could do that. I'll do whatever. And he's like, EJ Healy wants you and his battalion? I'm like, yeah, he does. And he's like, oh, man, he, he's a great officer. And, you know, my other a couple other officers were talking about me. And he just goes, okay, what if I offered you first battalion? and you get to go into Helmand, like 1st Raider Battalion. I'm like, yes. And he's like, all right, go home and think about it, because you're going to have to move to the West Coast. I'm like, sir, I'm good. I'm like, I'll pack now, let's go. And he's like, just, you know, I like this, because he's like, I'm trying to give orders to other captains, and they, they get all upset about it. And I keep looking at myself like, I'm a colonel, they're a captain, they should take my orders because they're lawful, but they keep fighting me with it. So he's like, you're literally going to accept an order I'm giving you? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, wow, that's really nice of you. He's like, nope, go home, think about it. Call me in the morning. So I go home and I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. Like I'm doing this. And I called him up the next day. I'm like, sir, I'm good. Let's go. And he's like, thank you. He's like, all right, we'll get you orders. And he cut me orders to um, 1st Battalion. And I was excited because, I mean, that's, you know, I was thinking if I stay on the East Coast, okay, you might go to Herat, Farah. I'm not saying they're not doing some cool things there. But again, Hellman was the fight area. To me, 1st was kind of like the premier battalion in, in Marsoc. It was just... All the stories were coming out first, all the fighting, everything they were doing. So I was really like, wow, like I'm kind of here. This is what I work to do. And then I couldn't believe it when I got pulled in to meet my company commander. He's like, you're going to have the commando mission, which is like the dream mission. You do either village stability platform stuff. And that's where basically teams are going in, wearing local dress, bearded up, um, building things like a well, standing up a police force, doing limited raids and just trying to let them stand up on their own and do their thing. The commando mission is you would fly after high value targets or you'd go in and help the VSPs with more white space, but you were flying in there for a fight. The way we trained the commandos, they were pretty much going to be like army rangers. They're not there to shake hands, kiss babies. They're there to go Hulk smash time. So when I heard that, I was like, holy crap, man. I just flew under like a lucky star on this one. It was just amazing how much this changed my life because uh, we had really great team commanders, guy Derek Carrere. Derek's doing tremendous work in the in, uh, medical. And then Captain Matt Manukin, who was just amazing guy. We lost Matt over in Afghanistan. 
And then just a team I got to work with. It was just an amazing team. Pretty fair to say every time I go to bed and every time I wake up, I'm probably thinking of that team pretty close at each time. It's um, That was such an impactful deployment. And like I say to people, it was the best deployment and it was the worst deployment all at once. So the time frame that we were going in there was, uh, our deployment was going to be from like May and going through, I think like, November, early December. And we were gonna be there in the heart of fighting season. And I kind of laugh, it was a well-known time when that happened, basically because after Croptober, the Taliban would just walk back down to Pakistan, hang out for the winter, and then springtime, they'd walk back up, have the farmers throw out poppy, poppy would grow, cultivate the heroin, they would sell the heroin, the Taliban would tax them, that's how they made their, their, their money source. So like, I remember this like one general saying, he's like, oh, the fighting season, I don't believe in that. He's like, we're Marines, we always fight. And I just remember one of the guys was like, looked at me, he's like, do you think the enemy might have a vote in that one? You know, there's no one to fight. You're not really fighting too many people. So we come in there and it was already starting to kind of heat up a lot. And we uh, did a first couple of missions, everything was good. I and mean, everyone I think started getting into like their battle rhythms and just feeling more comfortable. And so it was a night in June and I'm talking to Derek Carrera, who's doing a build stability platform at this uh, place called VSP Watan, which was in the Nari Siraj district of the Helmand province. You know, we would pretty much be up all night because that's when we were doing our planning. We'd have to coordinate with like the 160th and everything. So I get on the phone with Derek and it's like midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, hey, what you got going on? And he's like, oh, we're gonna do an ambush out here. And we got, you know, some bad guys keep going by this one area. So we're just gonna go take care of it. I'm like, all right, man, cool. Happy hunting, whatever. They take off and we're sitting there working. And the way our operations center was set up, it was basically like a stadium seating deal. And I think we had like four flat screen TVs. So one was just kind of like an admin one, another one, we might have some like uh, ISR feeds and stuff like that on a couple of them. And then we had one that was just a rolling Merc chat. So essentially what Merc chat is, it's like a rolling text message. Like whatever people are saying on the radio, they'll print out and you can kind of read the transcript. So I saw uh, Derek's team, it's like, Six in the morning, like right when the sun came up, it's like Copperhead, three one, three enemy KIA. And it's like, all right, man, good for them, man. They got some. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go down, take a couple hours to like get some sleep here. I've been up all night and go down to my room. And forever from this point, whenever I'd hear feet running towards my room, I would just get up and put my blouse on because I knew something bad was happening. Doors knocking. It's uh, one of my guys, uh, Aaron Brandfast. And he's like, hey, we got to get her to the hospital. And the reason why we would always go over to the hospital, like I said, we were on the main base and we could drive over to the medical center. And we wanted to be there for any special operation forces or if a Marine was attached to special operation force, we wanted to be there to at least greet them. People ask, why didn't you go over forever a Marine? I'm like, we never would have left. I mean, it was just, they were getting so many casualties. Get my blouse on, go. I look at the Merc chat. I see gunshot wound to the neck and a gunshot wound to the shoulder. And you're just thinking like, oh boy, that neck one's not good. Drive over. Going to the hospital, they're not there yet. We're like, all right, let's go over and get some coffee. Get some coffee, come back. Now they're bringing them in. And it was Derek Carrera and this guy, Ricky Barrier. And it was actually on Prime Hall's team that this happened to. Ricky's like, he's just not there. He's just like, he's out. And Derek's talking. Now they shot Derek up with some ketamine, so he was kind of not feeling much pain. And it was kind of humorous because he kept saying like, dude, you gotta get out there, you gotta go kill those guys. I'm like, all right. And he would like pass out, he'd wake up. Dude, you gotta get over there, you gotta go kill those guys. I'm like, got it. And he would pass out. Dude, you gotta get over there, you gotta go kill those guys. I'm like, we're all over it, man. Like, let's just get you fixed, right? The doctor looked at me and he goes, hey, can you take the sight of blood? And I'm like, sure. And he's like, okay. I gotta do something real quick to Derek, but can you just sit and talk to him while I do it? So they kind of just rolled Derek up on his one shoulder and doctor's going away and me and Derek are just face to face talking. And eventually Derek wipes out and the doctor's like, I got to talk to you. And as he's talking to me, it was like a scene from Peanuts, right? It's just like, bah, 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 bah. like I don't hear a word he's saying. And I'm like, sir, you got to say that again. He goes, you didn't hear anything I just said. I'm like, I did not. And he's like, Derek's paralyzed right now. And I'm like, okay. He's like, we don't know how severe, we don't have the equipment, but as of right now, he can't use his legs. So I'm like, got it. So I knew the team was in a really bad situation up there at Watan. Pretty much after they shot the uh, guys on the ambush, there was a counter ambush, and they pretty much had these guys surrounded and they couldn't move. 
ultimately I knew that meant we would have to go get into helicopters and fly up and help relieve them and do some stuff. So totally cool with that. Like we want to help out our boys. Went outside after I hear about Derek's paralyzed, kind of had a two minute cry and I'm like, okay, get that out of your system. Go brief the guys. I'm like, here guys, this is what's happening. Go back to uh, Camp Antonick. Just gear, get my gear ready. I got my cell phone. When we get the call, let me know and I'll just meet you guys over at Camp Antonick and we'll take off. And they're like, got it. Just sitting there with Derek, talking through some stuff. Uh, Derek doesn't know what's going on yet. Uh, you know, we're, we're joking around, we're goofing off, and Derek's like, dude, you think I could do the commando mission next time? I want to do what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, why not? And he goes to sleep, and I look at the doctors. I'm like, what's the deal here? Like, when are we going to tell him? And they're like, well, we figured we'd tell him in Germany. And I'm like, no, he's not going to find out from a stranger. When he gets up, I'll tell him. And the doctor's like, I would like to be here for him. I'm like, please do. And so Derek gets up. I'm like, listen, man, i got to tell you something. This isn't going to be easy. And he's like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, you, you obviously well, you know you're wounded. I'm like, right now, you don't have the ability to use your legs. Um, you're, you're paralyzed at the moment. And he's like, oh. Looks at the doctor and he's like, hey, my wife and I wanted to have kids when we got back. Is that still a possibility? And she's like, not the traditional route at this time. And he's like, okay. And he's like, can I have some morphine? And they're like, sure. It takes morphine, wipes out. And I swear to God, Derek wakes up. You just think he's just been told I couldn't even fathom what's going through your head at that point when you hear that noise, that news. And Derek's like, yeah, man, screw it. All good. I'll be like Professor X. I'll just be a guy in a wheelchair kicking ass. No big deal. That was it. And he like literally looked at himself like, well, how do I go to the bathroom now? And later, once he got out of the Marine Corps, he actually developed a catheter that you can leave in your body for a long time and stuff like that. So he's doing a lot of stuff for, uh, for people on the medical side, which is pretty incredible. So we pack up Derek, get him up on a, on a, uh, Hilo and he he goes all the way back home. We were supposed to get into this fight and they would not let us. Um, the reason being is the Marine general who's in charge of Afghanistan, they thought there were civilian casualties and they thought if they brought us in, we were just going to cover for the guys and not report what was really happening on the field, which was complete bullshit. And the Hellman is its own area. I don't care where you are in Afghanistan. Nothing's like that spot. So they actually flew the commando team in from Kandahar, which was a SEAL team. And I knew the guys over there, good dudes. One being a sitting congressman, Dan Crenshaw. He was like the two IC at the time. Our special operation task force had to give a quick hip pocket class to these guys, like what they're gonna see when they're in the helmet and what to do. And they come in, uh, Brian Jacklin, who was on Derek's team, uh, actually was awarded Navy Cross for, this, uh, for that whole incident. He's like, I'll stay behind and work with the SEALs to make sure they're good to go. And basically, he's like, hey, guys, you got to get into a compound. You're going to turn into a pumpkin. Sun comes up. They're all over us. Do not walk through a doorway. Their interpreter walked through a doorway, hit an IED. Part of the IED hit Dan Crenshaw. He lost an eye. So it was a pretty bad situation. Their team commander called me up pissed off, like flipping out, because he thought I didn't want to go in there and fight. And I'm like, whoa, 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 let's take a step back here. I'm like, those just aren't Marines. Those are like my drinking buddies. Like, trust me, when we want to get in there, they weren't letting us. And he's like man, I can't believe, if that's what you guys face every day, I'm like, that's the Hellman. That was kind of a big, oh boy. And then it just seemed from that point on, every time the red phone rang, we all just kind of look at each other in the operations center like, who's it gonna be? And it was usually some sort of bad news. I don't say this to brag, but what was told to me was that summer 2012 was the bloodiest summer for special operation forces since the Vietnam War. Later in that deployment, it was in the July time frame. This is where kind of like, um, I joke like the ugly American kind of comes up. Like we have lines on a map and we think we know areas and stuff. And sometimes we might just ignore the local culture. So we had this big operation on the Western side of the Hellman River. And essentially we coalition forces had control of the East side, the West side, the Taliban had freedom of movement. So we wanted to go in there, insert a SEAL team. It was actually another Marine Raider team set up another village stability platform and let them kind of grow. And then we would start branching out more in the West and trying to lock that place down. Did our thing, it was like the largest coalition force, I guess, uh, offensive of the summer. It was me, I had like five more commando teams at my uh, uh, command and all that stuff. And, you know, we did some really good stuff. We're out there for a long time and no one got really banged up. So it was uh, ultimately pretty good. And now they're like, we want to put you in North, Northern Shurike. Now, as you're flying in, you can kind of see the uh, network that the Taliban has. Like, they'll come out with torches and kind of wave them or lights and stuff. And they're basically tr tracking how we fly up there so they can kind of do an early warning network. 
And as we're flying in, I get a call from the pilot. And he's like, hey, they know like what LZ we're going to land in. And it turned out one of the drones was up there flying around and had its lights on. So they're literally like looking up at this thing like, OK. The Taliban would set up mattresses right by places that looked like landing zones. And that was like their point in place of duty. They'll sit there and wait. And if someone flew in, they would do what they had to do. So we're already kind of thinking like, oh, boy, they know we're coming. Well, we'll see what, how this goes down. And we came in under a little bit of fire. And we land. Remember, I come running out. Like, I was the first one off the helicopter since I was ground force commander. And I came off, and I slipped, and I fell down. And next thing you know, a couple of rounds go flying by. Getting a call from uh, the uh, AC-130 above us. They're like, hey, you guys got Taliban all around you. And even the guy on the minigun on the side, he was wailing away as we came landing in. And I can't stress enough how these 160th guys are very professional, been there, done that. But when I saw them starting to get a little nervous, I'm like, oh, this is, this is a real deal. Even to the point, I looked down, I'll never forget looking out the side of the helicopter and you saw the one pilot took his M4 out and he's shooting it and it's like going all over the place because he didn't have next to him. And we're like, oh boy, so little birds are whizzing by doing all this, kind of break everything up. We go take down a compound and I just remember thinking like, man, this is, we're going to earn our stories in this one. And it turned out we were in an area called Kaligas. And Kaligas was essentially like the Taliban capital, if you will. Uh, we're even intercepting them on the radio where they're like, why are they, why are they here? Don't they know this is like our, our place type of thing? So we're trading casualties back and forth. And typically the way it would go is, you know, say we came in nighttime, we would do a raid, get into a gunfight, be up all night doing what we had to do. Then you would hear everything kind of chill out. You hear morning prayer. Then after morning prayer, they would kind of walk around, look for us. We would get in some sort of fight. Everything would kind of chill out, afternoon prayer. Then after afternoon prayer, another fight would kind of happen. Then nighttime, they just kind of went away because we would we dominate the nighttime. Morning prayer goes, we have a gunfight. Everything, you know, kind of, it's just pretty crazy. Had a couple casualties, so we're flying guys out. And I remember that afternoon, I'm in a position, and there was my corpsman and my dog handler. And I'm talking to my corpsman. His name was Max. And it was just like a hot... July day, like super humid, every, it was just gross. And I'm like, man, I could go for an ice cold Coke right now. And as soon as I said that, I heard the UGL or underbrow grenade launcher, I heard the grenade like whiz by my head and it just sounded like a fly ball. And I either said the word fuck or I was definitely thinking that word, like they got me. Bang, that thing cranks off. And shrapnel goes all throughout the left side of my body up into the left part of my head. Max gets hit in his tricep. And Joe, our dog handler, got hit underneath his uh, place into his stomach. So he just dropped. And I now know what it's like to be in a popcorn machine because there was so much fire coming down on us. You felt like you're in a popcorn machine with everything popping up underneath of you. And one of my guys, I think, put it best where he's like, Hellman almost felt like a triple canopy jungle at some of the places you're operating in. And the guy's like, you know, it felt like a giant. Giants put their hands on the trees and were shaking him. Because all the RPGs and the mortars and underbarrel grenade launchers and small arm fire that was just flying through. It was crazy. So we get Joey into an area, kind of chaos is going on. I'm like, all right. And I just go back to like my high school coach. I remember him saying to me, like, when you start getting stressed out, take like three deep breaths and things will start slowing down. So I just kind of took some deep breaths and everything just started slowing down. I now had to get on the radio to call uh, back to the Special Operations Task Force. And I had to say a phrase that basically means I'm getting overran. So every aircraft available will start like boogieing towards us as fast as possible. Then we got to play like traffic cop where you start breaking them up and all that, like deconflicting them. The first thing I would do, you know, we start getting the firefight going. We're, I'm talking to the other elements. We're moving these guys around. We got some good aircraft coming in. We're going to do some good stuff. And then I got to start providing information about the casualty. So I'd have to give a thing called a missed report, mechanism, injury, signs, symptoms, and treatment. And then at the end, you give a battle roster number. So your battle roster number would be the first two letters of your last name and your last four of your social security. So I'm Bravo Uniform 0429. So go through, I do uh, Joey's missed report, give his battle roster number. Go through, I give Max a report, give his battle roster number. Now I'm doing my own missed report. I'm kind of like looking around. I'm like, all right, I got that going on, this going on. This back of my left leg, it was like a rooster tail. It's just squirting blood everywhere. And one of my element leaders, Mike McClurg, he's like trying to find the wound and he can't, he doesn't know what's going on. He's like, I am so sorry. And he ripped a tourniquet off of my chest. And he's like, so we kind of tourniqueted it up, which hurts like hell when you get one of those things really clamped on you. So I go through, get my missed report. Then I get my battle roster. I'm like, Bravo Uniform 0429. And you hear it get quiet. And they're like, say again. I'm like, Bravo Uniform 0429. 
gets quiet. They're like, say that one again. And I'm like, guys, it's me. I'm wounded. I'm like, let's go. We got to get into this. And they're like, okay. And like, everyone was cool. We kind of moved the Taliban to like kind of an advantageous area where we're going to drop a couple of 500 pound bombs on them and pretty much end it. So we had an F-16 flying in. He's coming in, he's in the pop, wing level, we're like cleared hot, let it ride. And next thing you know, he's like, he's he's like, fuck. And he's like, weapons jam, weapons jam, weapons jam. And he pops out, meaning he had a malfunction and his computer wasn't letting him drop. So we got him out of the stack. We brought in a daytime AC-130 uh, called Recoil and we just started dropping Griffins all over the place and just started breaking things up. Looked over at Joey, he's starting to turn green and you just kind of knew like, all right, we're, we're on the clock here. I grabbed one of my intel guys and put him next to me. I'm like, just pay attention to what I'm saying because I've never been shot, so I don't know if I'm going to piss myself and fall over and forget who I am for 30 minutes, but we just need to stay on top of it. And we just start both dying laughing when I said that. I'm like, well, here we go. We ended the fight. We killed a lot of the bad guys, and now I'm starting to bring in the uh, Blackhawks to get, all, get us out. I'll never forget, prior to this mission, the Air Force PJs were like our guys who were um, picking us up a lot, doing our casualty stuff. And they came in and briefed us about this new concept they have called a Gator Team. And if you request a Gator team, you'll get like five PJs who know tactics, know some stuff, and they can kind of help supplement. If you're losing a lot of, you know, Marines, they can come and help supplement because you got all these Afghans out there and you want to kind of keep that control of your Afghan commandos. So I'm like saying like, okay, okay, I need a Gator team. They're like, Roger that, Gator team. And I'm like, cool. I remember I put my hand on a wall and the wall just collapsed. And next thing you know, these like hornets come out. So now I'm getting stung. And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> so I've been shot and I'm stung. And then I realized I have a big piece of metal sticking out of the side of my head. And I'm just like, ow. And they're like, yeah, we're not taking that one out. I'm like, okay. We're going up to the PJs and they're all standing out there in the defense. I'm like, where's your gator team? And the guy's like, what's a gator team? And I'm like, failure. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I'm never gonna ask for that again. So there's no gator team. I get on the helicopter, we get Max, we get Joe. We had to get Yona, our dog on the helicopter. And I just remember looking at like, there was not many guys left, Marines. And it was like, two of them are like looking at me and they like look back at like, the, our compound, they're like, it's like chaos. And they're like, oh my God. And I told the guy who was in charge, I'm like, listen, it was my ops chief. I'm like, your call, but I highly recommend during a period of darkness tonight, get an emergency extract and just get everyone out of here, you know, cause we're just running low on everything. And he's like, yep, totally. So now we're flying back. It's probably been about 40 minutes after the incident. My fun meter is starting to be pegged. The amount of adrenaline that hit my body was unbelievable. But now the adrenaline is wearing down and I'm starting to feel it. And so the PJ is like, hey, man, you want a shot? Pulls out a needle. And I'm like, sure, whatever that is. And it was ketamine. Hits me up with that. Now I'm kind of having like an outer body experience. Like, it's weird. Like, you know where you are, but you don't know how to get anywhere. It was just like, and you're totally limp. So they're pulling me out of the helicopter. Again, big chunk of metal on the side of my head. The one British nurse didn't realize that and like sliced his hand open on, on my uh, shrapnel in my head. So to pull me in to get a CAT scan, British nurse walks in and goes, I need to see Captain Buckley by himself. And everyone leaves and she's like, do you have HIV or AIDS? And I'm like, no. And she's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I literally just got tested like before I got here. She goes, now we got to do an HIV test. And I'm like, why? And it's like, well, the nurse cut his hand open on you and you guys bled into each other. And I'm like, okay. And like, you know, so now I'm keeping the tally, like been shot, stung. Now I'm getting an HIV test. Pulled me in to get surgery done, and the doctor's like looking at my left leg. He's like, dude, I don't know about that leg. We might have to take it. And I'm like, okay. Shot, stung, getting tested for AIDS. Now I might lose a leg. And I'm like, you know what, doc? That's it. If you take my leg, when I wake up, I'm going to beat you down with that thing. And he starts laughing. He's like, all right, man, happy thoughts. Go under, I wake up. Everything's still there. I'm like, great. If we were a KIA, obviously things got to happen. People got to get phone calls back in America. If you're wounded in action, that's on you. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. It's all good. I wake up, people are coming to visit me. Like my platoon started from recon. He was back with recon again. They were there. He comes over and like as Mary was coming in, bringing tobacco tins and putting it on my table. And I'm like, all right, calves looked awesome. Like Barry Sanders size. Like they were just so swollen and everything. And Kenny's like, have you called your parents? I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, come on, you, you, you need to call them. And I'm like, fine. Didn't think they're going to know anything that's going on. I call home and they're like, oh my God. And apparently they, everyone knew what was happening. So they got a phone call, said, your son's been in a firefight. We'll call you later. And like, that was it. So my mom like ready to collapse, but the battalion back here did a great job. They were calling like Bill Lombardo actually I brought up. Um, he was back here in the rear and he was calling my parents every like 30 minutes to let him, let him know. So that, that was really good. Basically the doctors came in and said, all right, they want to send you home. And I'm like, okay, where are my options? And 
my doctor was really cool. He goes, well, they want to send you home, but if you want to stay, you're my patient. I'll keep you here. So what do you want to do? I'm like, I'm staying. He goes, I knew you were going to say that. And that's when I had told my mom. She goes, when are you coming home? I'm like, I'm not. And that was not fun for her to hear that one. Um, but Max and Joey had to leave. They did two more surgeries on me and then closed me back up. And literally six days later, I was back out in raids. So I didn't miss a single mission. So this is a credit to the doctors and the medical staff that they had there. I mean, they, they truly were the heroes out there. What they had to go through and what they saw day in, day out. Pretty incredible how they can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. After my last surgery, walked on the treadmill that night. Then the next day I did a three mile run and did my 20 pull-ups and back on full duty. So it was good to go. Seven days later, I lost the only Marine I ever had uh, under my command. He was uh, Corporal Josh Ashley from uh, Rancho Cucamongo. We promoted him up to sergeant after we lost him, but Josh was great. So when we went over there as a team, we had one dog handler and one dog uh, TO'd to us. We needed three more just because how valuable dogs were. You don't want to overwork them. And when we would go out, we'd have three elements out and one element back in the rear. Um, so we had to call over to the MEF and Marine Expeditionary Force and see if we get some dogs cut to us. And it's these three corporals come over. And it was just pretty funny to see these like three Marine corporals in their Marine Corps uniform. Obviously, you see a captain, you're probably like, holy shit. But they come over, we're in different camis, we got longer hair, we don't have to blouse our boots. You know, I just walk up and they're like, oh, sir, and this and that. I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, your guy's hair is a little bit too short, you're making us nervous, so grow that out. And they're like, I'm like, and you get your own room. And they're like, wait, what? They're like, your own room, we treat you like men as long as you act like a man. And they're like, oh my God. So they, these guys were like in heaven. And they were awesome dudes. And Josh especially, Josh was a brick shit house, big dude. He was a phenomenal water polo player. And I tell people what usually gets people in selection is a green tick, you know, having a ruck on your uh, rucksack on you or the water. I mean, the water will humble anyone. Josh is a beast. He can swim like a fish. Like we got to put him through selection. So we started putting his package together and I told him like, hey, when you get back, we're going to nominate you to go through selection. He's like, do you think I can make it? And I'm like, this is a lot of paperwork we're doing. If I didn't think you make it, trust me, I got many other things I could be doing. I mean, I need like to watch episode three of uh, you know that like whatever series I'm in at that point. Put them on down to a village stability platform, uh, working with our Army Green Berets, and it was an area called Zambale. And so typically, when we would patrol, you never patrolled on like a road or anything like that because that's where an ID is going to be. So you'd always go where humans wouldn't walk. So going down this little like river stream bed. No reason there should have been IEDs or anything in that area. Sent his dog Sirius across. He kind of did his little walk around. Didn't pick anything up. Josh is like, I got him. I'll go up. Puts his hand on Sirius and then let go and then took a step back. And then he stepped right on an IED in this crank. So he goes flying in the air. Sirius runs into essentially what's a minefield. So basically guys are on their hands and knees working their way to get to Sirius to bring him back. Josh was a triple amputee at this point, so it took six tourniquets to slow down the bleeding. And got the medevac in there, got him on the helo. They pumped him full of some good stuff. He rallied for a minute or so, and then it, it was just too much for his body, and he, he didn't make it back to Bastion. I had to write the one letter I never thought or ever wanted to write to his family. They always had ramp ceremonies, and um, you know, so that night we, we got him on to an aircraft, sent him back uh, to America. And I was really impressed because while like where we're working on, on Camp Antonick, I mean, we were in charge of the 7th Afghan Special Operations Battalion. So I had uh, 777 Afghan commanders and special forces. And then we also had 18 United States logistical training team guys. So like 18 civilians, and they were doing things like plumbing, electricity, all that kind of teach the Afghans how to do it. But every single one of all the Afghan commando and special forces showed up there and they don't, they didn't have to, they showed up and all of our logistics guys all stood up and it was a really great send off for this guy. Put the letter, gave it to the, uh, a pilot, just grabbed him, looked at him like this letter goes back with him and to his family. And they're like, we won't mess this one up and got him back. And, um, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it. You know, I talked about my corpsman, like Max and a couple of guys, they're already back there because they got banged up. So they were able to kind of jump on with the family. And these guys weren't MARSOC. They were Marine Corps. They were just attachments to us. But we totally brought them into the fold and took care of the family, had guys at the funeral. Um, 
we were able, able to live stream the funeral to us in Afghanistan so we could watch it. We got him up to a bronze star uh, with a V, which I thought was very appropriate. This is where I get a little frustrated with the Marine Corps and medals. I think we don't really pay attention to our uh, award manual. So again, he's not MARSOC. I couldn't put him through my chain of command. I had to go back through his chain of command. And whoever his battalion commander was, he was like, no way he gets a bronze star. Like, I don't have a bronze star. And it was like, that's not the point. And if it makes you feel any better, he won't wear a bronze star either. It's gonna go on a mantle at his parents' house. And next thing you know, I, I get a call from Ratchet and he goes, hey, don't worry about, he, this guy's checking out, the new guy checking in, we've already briefed him, he's on board. And I'm like, perfect. Bang, 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 as soon as that guy came in, right through MEF, got him a bronze star with a B and got him up to the rank of sergeant. You know, I still talk with his family, uh, been to his uh, grave site, and, you know, it was tough, um, you know, thinking what we all kind of been going through, but, you know, again, it was gonna keep getting worse and worse, that deployment. Kind of the one that I think a lot of people have heard about and everything was the incident that happened with Matt Manukian and Ryan Jeske team. So this took place, all this was in July, this took place in August. And we went out, did a commando mission. This is one date that will, I'll never forget, is July 1st, 2012. And why that date is so significant, before they had the Afghan commandos and had the Afghan special forces, and they were separate. And the special forces guys had a major who's in charge of them. The Afghans had a lieutenant, uh, commandos had a lieutenant colonel. Well, they wanted to basically morph the special forces and commandos together under one house. And it would have been my lieutenant colonel, uh, Colonel Jabbar, who was an Afghan commando. He would be in charge of everyone. And I remember asking, like, higher, I'm like, what am I doing with these special forces guys? Like, what, what's the plan? And they're like, oh, you know, figure it out, all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, great. And I remember walking out of my hut, and I just see all these Afghan special forces guys staring at me. And, like, one guy looked like Jack Sparrow, just, like, crazy hair and everything. And I'm like, what is this? And all I want to do is go back into my hut and just, like, put my pillow over my head and just be like, just wake me up when this is over. But I'm like, all right. So I grab element leaders and up, and I'm like, guys, this is a situation. Let's just problem solve this and throw up on the whiteboard and figure out what to do. And the way we would train our commandos, we had um, red, amber, green. Red was we, we would send them on leave. They got to go home. Uh, amber was training missions, and then green was their operational. So amber, they're more or less just shooting, kind of getting ready. Green, we're putting them out in missions. And one of the guys was like, let's just do that with the Afghan Special Forces. Red, amber, green, we're going to need some of the guys from the VSP to send us some help because we can't handle all that. So if they got guys who are going out there to the VSP, have them come in and train. And I'm like, no, you got it. We're getting going, and then, you know, now it's like the August time frame. And we went out and did a mission, again, down in the Nari Siraj area. And it was a great mission. Um, we went after one of the objectives. We missed him, but we got his brother. We got his number two. Um, the actual Taliban commander got so upset, he was going to make a run at us, but never did. I mean, it was, just, it was awesome. And no one got hurt. Like it was, it was like the first time I didn't call a Kazi back, and I couldn't believe it. You know, we get into the team room. We're playing Motley Crue, Home Sweet Home. Everyone's feeling good. We're having some of our Afghan Domino pizza. Everyone, this is a blast. We're just joking up, getting ready to do debriefs, and the phone rings, and it was my XO Matt Lampert again. And he just said to me, he's like, I, I can't say the words. He's like, just pay attention to the Merc chat. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, probably have to go to the hospital here. I'm like, guys, start getting your blasters on. We might have to shoot over to the hospital. And that's when we saw what was going on with Manukian's team. We saw him, Ryan Jetsky, Sky Moat, and Brian Jakes as casualties and like WIAs. So I'm thinking, oh man, what'd they do? They must hit an IED or something like that. And then it came back like dot, 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 heroes. And it had Matt Manukian, Ryan Jetsky, and Sky Moat. And we're just like, what the hell's happening here? So we drive over to the hospital. PJs come down with the, with our casualties, and they just looked at us, and they're just like, not you guys again. And we're like, well, here we are. They're like, this is just messed up. That's when the word started getting out of what happened, and that's when we found out it was an insider attack. And essentially, the team had a meeting. They go back into their operations center. Uh, Afghan police officer, uh, what turned out to be a Taliban dressed in a police officer's uniform, knocked on the door, just was there for whatever reason. Um, Ryan Jeske, the team chief, looked at the team commander, Matt Manuki, and said, hey, do you got a meeting with this guy? Matt's like, no. And he's like, that's all right. I'll walk him back to the um, police station. Heard a couple AK rounds go off. No one really thought 
that big of a deal because unfortunately you heard a lot of negligent discharges on the VSPs. But then the rounds started coming through the operations center. And from what I understand, Matt ended up in a corner. Brian Jakes and a couple other guys were in the center of the room. And Matt's like, guys, get out of here. As they're running out, that Taliban guy came in, shooting at him, chasing him out the wall, hit Jakes in the arm, and then he got Matt. And then Sky Moat, who was already wounded, he could have walked out a back door. He decided to go help Matt, and uh, he went out. Unfortunately, um, he was killed as well. From what I understand, that guy kind of ran, the Taliban dude ran out, jumped over like a HESCO barrier, and there's a car waiting for him and drove him down. And, uh, you know, I have it on very good authority. He's no longer alive, which is good, but he wasn't anyone of super significance. He was just a guy who went for a home run, and boy, did he hit it, uh, unfortunately, because you got to think of a special operations team. A team commander, team chief, EOD chief, and an element leader, that's a hell of a loss right there. That, that really hurts. And God bless 7th Marines. They were packed up, ready to go home back to America, and they unpacked and provided a cordon and safety for, uh, for that village stability platform. Just a, a crazy night. I mean, we, we go, we're in the hospital. You know, we had some big missions coming up. So we're like, all right, let's regroup tomorrow morning. And it was so weird. Like, you wake up, and it was like, that had to be a dream. You know what I mean? Like you're kind of waiting, like no way that's real. And then you're like, oh my God, that, that this this is a reality. And it was just like, Jesus. Then we got word we were on a tactical pause for a week. Uh, they were going to figure out what to do with us. Like what I heard, it went up to like President Obama level. And he's like, why are we still doing this? You know, like, where are we going to get pulled out? I don't know. So with that, they're like, we're not doing anything. They're like, we want you to fly Matt home. Matt and I, we became really close like right away. Uh, when I first checked in, me, the other team commander, Derek Carrera, and Matt Manukin, we went out to Sedona, Arizona, of all the places. If you've ever been to Sedona, it's very like artsy and kind of stuff like that. We went out there to do like combative training, like live blade fighting and all this stuff. So it was like kind of totally opposite of like what you would think Sedona is. And we all just kind of bonded really fast. And Matt and I were the same type of guy. We always had a lot of fun with each other, always hanging out at Seal Beach and stuff like that. Never met his family though. If you ever saw the movie uh, Taking Chance, it was like with Kevin Bacon. He's a Marine Lieutenant Colonel and it's talking about him bringing home a Lance Corporal that grew up in the same area he did and like going through the airports and doing all this stuff. And it was crazy how similar my experience was. We get them, it's, you know, have a ramp ceremony. It is a, just a really hard night. We had one Marine general out there who didn't like us and that didn't make things any better. I mean, like the boys weren't really holding back a little bit. We fly into Kandahar, see some people there, they're just coming up. Everyone's just in like disbelief, like what we're dealing with in the helm. And from there, we had to fly up to Germany. If you ever been to um, Ramstein and you can go into like that mall right by the airport, we go like, basically we, take uh, the heroes where we can put them. They're like, all right, here, they're here in isolation. I'm like, can we stay with them? They're like, you guys aren't allowed to. We're like, okay. And they're like, it's totally fine though, it's under guard, like you guys just need to go back to your rooms. So we go up to this restaurant and I know the guys were just kind of like looking like, what do we do? And I'm like, four shots of tequila, four beers. And just kind of did that. And I'm like, all right guys, I'm gonna head back to my room. You do what you guys gotta do tonight. Just know where we gotta be in the morning. And they're like, yep. And I'll just never forget that, that next morning I get up and I walk outside and I take a deep breath. And it was the first time I took a deep breath without coughing because it was like actually like clean air type of thing. And then we had to fly back to Dover. And it was just like pretty incredible how like people were bending over backwards for us. Like you had like, like the general's little area they hang out, they opened that up to us. The one thing that was frustrating was the misinformation getting out there. I was like reading Stars and Stripes. And some Air Force general made a comment like, well, you know, the Marines, they might not be best at this because they might be getting aggressive or something. And it's like, dude, you guys totally missed the point. And we fly back into Dover. We kept the heroes on the plane. And I'll never forget, like, the Air Force guys, like, the tears they had in their eyes because we slept next to with the heroes, like, on the plane back. And I just remember waking up them, taking a picture of us and, like, kind of, like, in tears. So I had to go over and meet the Manukians and all the families. So we had um, two more families that were there. And then a bunch of other Raiders showed up just to support. First time I met Matt's mom and met his brother. Clearly, they're going through a world of all this stuff. But I was glad I was there because, the, again, misinformation that was going back about Matt, I could kind of clear that up. You know, I just sat there with Patty Manuki and Matt's mom. I'm like, that's Matt right there. And she goes, I could tell and stuff like that. And got that, all that figured out. But then it was just amazing the support we had around us. You know, here I am. I'm like, you know, originally I thought I was going to bring Matt back to Dover turn him over to another escort and I was gonna get back to Afghanistan. But my command told me, they're like, if they want you to stay, you're staying, all right? And then you come back after the funeral. So I asked Patty, I'm like, what do you want me to do? She goes, I really need you to be here. I'm like, then I'm here. I'm like, this is my mission right now. So 
called up everyone. I'm like, hey, I'm going to stay here to the end, and I'm going to come back right after uh, the funeral. We had to help dress Matt up after they, they finished cleaning him up and get his medals and everything on. And I'm now thinking, I'm like, oh, crap. Like, dude, my blues and everything are in storage. Like, I'm like, what, what am I going to do? And they're like, oh, we, we'll just make you a new uniform. So they put together a whole new uniform for me right there, fit me for it and everything. And I'm like, wow. And they're like, but we don't have Marine Corps officer covers. And I'm like, shoot. So I call back down to Quantico to the Marine shop. And they always told us, no matter where you are, if you buy from the Marine shop, we will take care of you. So I'm like, well, here we go. And I'm like, hey, this is a situation. And they're like, nope, Brian, we got your size right here. Got it. We'll, we'll be up there shortly. And the guy drove through the night to come up to Delaware to hand me my uh, my cover to make sure I had it. And I was like, this is incredible. And I mean, the the, the amount of attention to detail and the work that goes on there at Dover, I, I, they don't get enough credit. I mean, I think it'd be easier to break into a nuclear arm facility than to get back to where we were there. They so professional, everyone on top, of everything, all the support. But this was the uh, an interesting part. So when you're flying the hero back, it's usually on a small plane and you get like one family member and the escort and everyone else has to fly commercial. I tell everyone I fear no man, but I do fear Patty Manukian. Uh, she's the sweetest lady you ever meet, but when she wants something, it's like, you can just tell she means business. And by the way, she's like an appellate justice in California. So she, she knows what's going on. And she's like, Brian, I want all this on the plane with Matt. And I'm like, you want like, and I mean, her sister was out there. We got me, we got another escort. We got the brother. Like there was probably like five or six of us. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, I look at the other escort, Joe Abacarian. I'm like, let's see what we can do. So we drive back over to Dover and we're kind of telling them the situation. The, some of the enlisted guys were like sassing us. Like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, what the bleep? But now it's like, it kind of got contentious. This Air Force lieutenant comes in. He's just like, oh, God, what I walk into? Because now he has, like, two pissed-off Marine captains who are, like, ready to, like, jump down his throat. He's like, okay, gentlemen, he's like, if you guys can make that happen, like, we won't pay for it. But if you can make that happen, we will make sure that, like, Matt gets to where he needs to go to. So we call up the Marine Raider Foundation. We're like, here's the situation. Patty wants all of us on a plane together. We got to buy a commercial airline. Matt is a bigger dude, so it's not like any plane's going to work. Like, there's specific ones he, he can only get on. And they're like, here's a credit card number. Just give us a receipt. Just get it done. I'm like, all right. So we're calling all around the place. Finally, I think it was like Continental or something like that. They were flying from Philly to San Francisco. And we were able to get Matt on. So now bring Matt up to uh, up to Philadelphia, over to Philly. And this was like, this scene literally happened in Taking Chance. That's why I said, like, I'm not making this up. I'm literally, I couldn't believe it was happening. I'm in my dress blues trying to get through security. I got a lot of bells and whistles on, right? And they're like, you need to take that off. And I'm like, I'm not disgrace in this uniform. I'm like, do what you got to do. Like, go get a manager, take me into another room, wand me, whatever you have to, but understand, like, I'm not taking this uniform off. They're like, you have to. I'm like, that's not happening. And I'm like, I, I think you need to take a hard look at me and think, why am I dressed like this? And people behind me were picking it up and they're like, oh my God, just take it easy on that Marine. And eventually they're like, fine, we're calling security. I'm like, great. And again, I'm keeping my cool. Security shows up and I'm like, hey, here's a deal. And they're like, you're here with the the Marine that you're taking back to San Francisco, I'm like, I am. They're like, we are so sorry. They're like, can we just move you over here and wand you? I'm like, absolutely, no problem. And they're like, okay, so get through that. And then I go down to the flight line. So an air marshal walks up to me and he's like, hey, um, I, I was a sergeant in the army. Would you mind if I salute him as he goes by? I'm like, I'm like, well, why don't you do one more solid for me? I was like, how about you walk with me when I'm putting him on a plane? He's like, are you, are you serious? I'm like, dead serious. And he's like, oh, that'll be an honor of a lifetime. And then he starts choking up. I'm ready to choke up. I'm like, listen, man, you cry, I cry. So let's like be in this together. And he's kind of smiling because you got it. So me, Joe Apicarian, and this air marshal, we're putting Matt on the plane. I go back up. We get a Patty, Patty's sister, Mike, and we're going to walk onto the plane as we're walking on, the pilot, this female pilot, she comes out and she's just like looking at us and goes to Patty and she starts getting teary eyed. And I just kind of made a joke. I'm like, hey, you got a long flight here. We don't need this. And she starts laughing like, no, 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 I'm going to, this is going to be a very smooth, we'll take care of everything. Very, super nice. You know, we're like an hour out. So I'm like, okay, I'm like, I got to see if maybe they'll let us get off first. So I go up and talk to a stewardess and I explain the situation, which she knew. And she goes, Brian, I will make an announcement. I'll do my best. But if people want to get off the plane, I can't stop them. I'm like, totally cool. I appreciate that. You know, you see people see me in my dress blues are smiling at me and like, give me thumbs up. And again, they don't know what's going on. But I always tell people, you see a Marine in dress blues in the airport, they're probably escorting.
And so they make an announcement, like, the pilot's like, listen, I had an honor of a lifetime to fly back Captain Matt Manukian. The family's on the plane, along with two Marines that you probably noticed. If you wouldn't mind, would you allow them to deplane first, and then you guys could go afterwards? And, like, we land, no one said a word. It was, like, super quiet. Everyone just tears in their eyes, like, wa like watching us walk off. So go back down underneath the plane, bring Matt down, we're doing our salute. And they already had, like, California Highway Patrols waiting for us, the rest of Matt's family. Matt's dad is also a judge. They're there. And just my curiosity got the best of me, and I'm like, I just got to go look back at this airplane and see what they're doing. I turn back and look, and faces are just up against the window like no one left. We're driving back to Mountain View, uh, California, and literally the California Highway Patrol was, like, stopping the traffic. I mean, we are flying, and it's, like, middle of the night. Pull into Mountain View, fire station, police lights, everything people outside. I mean, again, this is probably like 11 midnight. I don't, it's, it's really late. And the whole town was lit up waiting. And we get them into the, uh, the funeral home. The family sees Matt and that was kind of tough. And they're like, all right, guys, like, you know, it's, um, time for you guys to probably to go home. And I'm like, yeah, that's just not going to happen. And pulled out a bottle of, uh, I think we had Johnny Walker or something. I'm like, we're staying here tonight. And the guy was like, you got it, just lock the doors. And so we just stayed out there with Matt, planned out the entire um, funeral really fast. We did it as high school at St. Francis, talked to my boss, General LeFevre, who was a great Marine general. He, I, I, he saved Marsoc, in my opinion. He flew out, and um, you know that's when Patty's like, I want you to provide a eulogy for Matt. So, And I just remember bringing Matt into, uh, it was in the gymnasium, and just making that turn and how deathly, it was just so quiet, like, Every, no one said a word. And I remember I looked and one lady made eye contact with me and she just starts bawling her eyes out. So I'm like, nope. I'm like, just pay attention. And then sat up there, gave the eulogy. I, the next day I was leaving Afghanistan. So I said like, you know, we. I wish I had turned back time. We can't, but I'm happy that I get a chance to go back over there and help to make some wrongs and the rights on this one. Next day, got on a plane and I was flying back to Afghanistan to get back into the fight. You know, when we have those, like, those rough nights, when we lose someone, I mean, my first mission in Afghanistan, that, that deployment, we were doing a relief in place with another team, right? And the way the team commander and I figured out we're going to do it, he would take the first part of the mission, then I'll take the second part of the mission. That way he can sit there and watch me talk, make sure I'm doing things and whatever. And as soon as I kind of took over command as the commander, boom, one of his guys got shot, a sniper right in the middle of the head. First guy up there to help him out, though, was an Afghan commando, like he, which is pretty incre uh, incredible. So we get him out, and we kind of knew this wasn't looking good, and he didn't make it. And we had a choice, and we're like, hey, let's continue with mission. We'll get extracted the next night like we were planning on it. Not much more we can do. And so what I would do from there on out, whenever we'd have those nights, you know, I'd give guys a half day. I'm like, figure out what you got to do. And then we're going to do a team lunch. So the whole team would have to come in together. Usually I'd throw a movie on, like we always like Big Lebowski or something like that, but I just had to get everyone back together not to get too isolated and start thinking too much. And then I, it wasn't be anything like, hey, pass the mic around and everyone's got to say a word, but it's like, anyone got anything on their mind, let's talk about it. Or we got the psychs, or the psychs here, you know, if you want to talk to that, like get ahead of that stuff. Because one thing I was really uh, impressed with Marsoc is trying to get ahead of problems. Like they would deploy uh, the therapists and everything with us so we could have those conversations without letting it like, compartmentalize and fester for years to come. You know, after we lost Matt and uh, Ryan and Sky, that's the same thing we did was team meetings, did a dinner together, and then we went over for the ramp ceremony. And, you know, the, it, again, like the, the team was doing great of keeping everyone focused, the leadership wise of what we had to do. I think one of the challenging parts was with Matt's team was actually telling these guys to take their foot off the gas. Uh, they were nonstop building intel packages. They were doing everything. I mean, literally the blood from is, was still on the floor is stained there. And these guys were just working 24 hours straight. They wouldn't stop until it was like, guys got to get some sleep. It's amazing how professional everyone kind of went through it and kind of how people understood what we were doing and what was happening and kind of had to set it aside to finish the mission. Everyone understanding what happens, happens. And we got like the way we honor them is we go take the fight. Like I'll never forget General LeFevre. I'm walking out of the Manukians, um house in the backyard and everyone was over there after the funeral and General Favor's looking at me and he's like, Buck, come here. And I'm like, hey, I'm like, hey, General, what's up? And he's like, what, what's happening over there? And we're kind of talking through some situations. And a lot of it was that 
we were just getting briefed that we were farther ahead than we actually were. It was like the policymakers didn't want to hear the reality on the ground. And it was like, we're not at that point yet. We got to kind of slow it down and get a little bit more deliberate. And he's like, well, what do you think? I mean, I was just with the commandant and they're wondering, do we like, not that he can make the decision, but should we pull us back in? What do you think? And I'm like, General, the only way we honor these guys is by going out there and taking the fight because that's what they would want us to do. I'm like, all of my friends died with a smile on their face and brass at their feet. And he just kind of smiled. He goes, that's exactly what I was telling the commandant. And I'm like, we got to keep going and keep the pressure on them. We did put a package together and we thought we might know where this guy is up in the north, like kind of near Matt's VSP. You know, I'll never forget, it was pretty funny. We had the uh, some of the VSP teams, right, were taking some of their assets to kind of train up some of the... Uh, of special forces guys. Everyone, again, wanted to get on these commando missions. My guys come in and it was this uh, SEAL was like his first deployment. And they're like, dude, he's a really solid dude. He's doing really great out there training. Like, it was throw him on the manifest. Let him go out there and fight. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, hey man, I'm like, do you want to go out on that mission? And he's like, oh yeah, yes sir. And I'm like, all right, cool. Call your team chief, make sure he's good with it. And we'll make it happen. I hear him like on the phone with the team chief. His team chief's like, fuck yeah, go like that. He's like. I'm in. We're like, all right, welcome. So we fly to this area, and as we're flying in, we had, like, basically the helo landed in the wrong spot. We are basically going to land at a spot, had a road, shelf, little flat thing, shelf, and big shelf. We were supposed to land on the big shelf. We brought the ladders with us. We are going to have to climb down and then get over to the compound. We flew in. We were browned out conditions, and essentially the pilot landed on the second shelf. So the ramp goes down. I'm walking out. Night vision on. All I see is just brown smoke. And I'm like, well, sometimes you gotta take a leap of faith. And I walked out and next thing you know, I am dropping. Like I was rolling down the windows. I was like, oh boy. And I just fell all the way down, landed, stuck the landing. My rucksack went left and then it went right. And it just kind of spun. And that's when I just heard the head of lettuce getting ripped. And I go flat on my face and I'm like, oh. And I'm on the road, which is not where you want to be. So all the other guys are doing parachute landing falls, jumping out and getting around me. They're like, hey, man, can you do it? I'm like, here, take my rifle and see if I can get up. And I stood and it just felt like broken glass in my ankle. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, that's not working. And they're like, do we need to get you in the, the helo? And I'm looking up at it. And it's like, again, I had to climb up a ladder and another thing. And we, bad guys are coming out. And that's a big bullet sponge. I'm like, get that thing out of here. And we'll, I'll figure it out later. So now I'm crawling. I go into a wadi, we're doing the raid. Um, I'm just kind of hanging out. I, like all of our explosives are not working. I'm like, God damn, when it rains, it pours. You know, it's just one of these nights. Do the raid, nothing too kinetic, get everything done. I, I come crawling in and we're gonna do a quick security patrol. And I looked at one of my guys, Aaron. I'm like, Aaron, find like LZ Black or something. Cause I, if, if you can find it, I'm gonna bring in a helo tomorrow night and I'll get out of here. I'm like, if not, I got to ride this one out because we're leaving in 48 hours and I can't have a helicopter land in the same spot three nights in a row. That's just asking for trouble. And he comes back and he's like, dude, there's nothing. I'm like, seriously? He's like, no. And I'm like, all right, we're riding out. So I just kind of have like my leg in the air. I have a pair of Chuck Converse on and we're like taping it up. All I can do is take aspirin because if I take narcotics, I can't be in command. I'll never forget, like we're, we're hitting these compounds, taking this firefight on and we had like a small D and we looked at that seal. I'm like, hey man, we're going to like shoot some machine gun rounds down that. You stand up and you shoot that right into that compound. He's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, welcome to the war. And he goes up like, Shoo. the compound melts. And he's like, this is like the coolest moment of my life. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, you know, you popped your cherry. So it was funny seeing that. But we kept it quiet. We didn't tell the command that I was banged up. And then we have to uh, crawl out. So crawling out, had to use my knees to climb up the ladder and go up three of those. And when the helo land, uh, one of my guys, Drew Simonetti, he just picked me up, ran me over to the to the ramp. And as soon as I got to the ramp, I like pushed off of him. And all I remember seeing him falling backwards, like through my green nods. <laughs> I'm like, boom, I land on the ramp. And I just kind of like crawled all the way up to the front by the pilots. And I had like a fentanyl lollipop, but I didn't use it. I was like, ah, whatever. And I just kind of took it in. And I was just telling everyone it was a high ankle sprain, but I was like, this is a little bit more serious. And you know, we land at Tombstone, and one of my guys walks up with crutches and crutch out. I'm like, all right, let's get some food. And then we do the debrief, and I'm like, all right, I got to go to the hospital and see what's going on here. And we were really close with the, the hospital staff. Unfortunately, we gave them a lot of business. Um, but, again, they were like the real heroes out there. And we had a swimming pool. We had a barbecue pit. 
we actually hosted all of them to come over and we cooked for them and let them swim just to try to give them some normalcy. I mean, I remember watching one of the nurses in the PX. She's in like a, her camis, but she has on some gray sweater, totally out of uniform, like just a regular sweater, black eyes underneath of her. And she's just staring at like ravioli cans. And I just like went up to her, I'm like, hey, and I, I gotta forget her name, but she's like, Brian, this is too much blood, too much blood. And I'm like, she's, I'm like, we gotta do something for these people. So they loved us, we took care of them. As I come rolling in, they're like, oh my God, not you again. And I'm like, sorry, you know, like that. And they're kind of looking at things. And the nurse, Stephanie, who I, I still talk to, Stephanie's like, Brian, I can't really call it uh, what happened to you, but mm, I'm looking at your x-ray. That is not a high ankle sprain. I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. So we're up all night kind of talking. Doctors come in, they're like, okay, you dislocated it and there's a spiral fracture. And they're like, so we got to put your ankle back in place. And then we got to look at where to do your surgery at. So I'm like, okay. So they pump me up, pull me in to get surgery. My surgeon who did my three surgeries on me, he's in there doing like a relief in place with the oncoming surgeon. And I come in, I'm like, hey. And he's like, you again? I'm like, I didn't want you to leave without saying goodbye. And he's like, Jesus, man. He's like, let me do this one. I've done enough work on this guy before. And he was just like, listen, <clears throat> I, we've given you a lot of anesthesia. He's like, so I'm gonna put you down really quick. And you're not even gonna really notice it, but I gotta get pretty violent on that ankle, but I'll get back in place. I'm like, all right, and we're just talking. And I'm like, when, when are you gonna do this? He's like, it's already done. I'm like, what? And it was like so trippy. He's like, dude, I went, you went down, I went boom, you came out, here we are. And I'm like, all right, that works. They're flying me up to, uh, over to Kandahar. That's where our CJ Sodaf was, the Combined Joint Special Operation Task Force, which is a full bird kernel. So CJ Sodaf is above the Sodaf. And then above CJ Sodaf is the Sojidaf or whatever. It's all the, like, that's a two-star general. So it was uh, seventh group was the CJ Sodaf from uh, Army Special Forces. Talking with the colonel, I'm just like, sir, let me get back in here. And he's like, to do what? I'm like, I know I'm not going to go on any missions, but I can come back, help plan, do whatever. I just got to finish this one out. And he's like, man, I'll do that. But he's like, listen, I see you on one manifest. I will personally fly over to Helmand and kick your ass. And I'm like, Sounds good, sir. And he's like, all right, you got to go up to Germany. They're going to do the surgery. Then we'll bring you back down. I'm like, great. They have the uh, SOCOM liaisons meeting me. And he's like, all right, my man, I hear you want to stay. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, cool. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get you an apartment out in town. We're going to get the surgery going and probably take you about three or four weeks to feel better. Then we'll send you back down to Afghanistan. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, so who would you like to have come to Germany? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, something like, give me 10 names of your friends and family and we'll fly them out here and they can hang out during your, your rehab. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, great. What size are you? Got it. I'm going to go buy you some clothes. I'll be right back and all that stuff. And the doctors come in and they're like, hey, we hear you want to stay and you want to go to Afghanistan again. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, we really commend you. Like, usually people want to get the hell out of here, but they're like, Brian, we could do the surgery, but your ankle's so swollen, we won't be able to put you back together again. And I'm like, oh, and it's like, so you got to go back to California and let that thing kind of die out for a little bit. Then they can do the surgery. So I'm like, fine. So flew back. I'm still fighting with them that they'll let me come back. Um, just basically had my leg up in the air for a couple of weeks. Swelling went down. They went to the surgery. They basically said, they're like, listen, if we put a big screw in your ankle, you're done. And when I woke up and they showed me the x-rays, there were six small screws and one very large screw. And they're like, that's it. So that was the end of that war. So I was just pretty much on the phone talking to the guys and all that stuff. But when everyone came back, we do a really great process called third level decompression, where we stay at a resort for a week. So I was able to go up there and kind of hang out with the guys when everyone came back. And that's when the parts started getting a little bit hard. I think that's when we were looking at the bar stools and seeing some empty ones that'll never be filled again. That's when you just remember how many guys you lost. Um, you know, the company lost a lot of guys, a lot of Purple Hearts, pretty nutty experience, but, um, you know, I was just glad I was there with the guys I was there with. The contract I signed when I got commissioned was like four active, four reserve. So by me being at eight, I knocked everything out. And I was on the fence, like what I was gonna do. I didn't wanna go back to the infantry. I didn't wanna go back to recon. I wanted to stay at MARSOC somehow, some way. And what they were doing at that time is officers would get five years and you had to rotate back to your primary MOS and then come back and do all this. And I think like a dozen of, of the team commanders, we all just got out at the same time, like we're just not doing it. And literally like six months later, they decided to close the loop and keep officers in. So if they would have got me orders to Naval Postgraduate School, I was gonna stay in. And one thing I kind of regret, but I, I ultimately know I made the best decision, they did dangle 
going to Quantico and being an instructor at the basic school in the infantry officer course. And I was like, man, that could be a really good way to have an impact on future officers. Sometimes I saw guys who were just more about the pomp and circumstance than actually worrying about the boys and understanding we work for them. We set them up for success. And we just we just eat all the bad news, but they get all the good good stuff. That might have been fun to do. But, you know, again, I can't complain where I am right now in life. It, you know, it was pretty... I guess, interesting. I mean, at the time, prior to going to Afghanistan, uh, Matt Manukian introduced me to this girl named Briar Strait, um, who later became Briar Buckley, and I married her. You know, for her, it, it, that would be an interesting perspective because what she was telling me, she's like, you know, I always knew we were at war, but I didn't really feel it. But then, you know, you and I start dating, and then I start meeting your friends, and then next thing you know, I'm getting emails of, that guy died and this happened. And like, literally I sent her an email. Hey, I hope everything's good. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, I got shot today. Don't worry about it. And kind of moved on. She goes, what the hell kind of email is that? Or you just like, Oh, by the way, I got shot, but Hey, have fun at roller skating or something You're like whatever. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to do something purposeful. So I jumped on with an ed tech firm. Uh, Cause I've really believed as people get taken advantage of, if they're not educated. And it's not odd enough that everywhere we went to go fight, these were not very well-educated people getting taken advantage of by people with some education. So I kind of got gung-ho and fired up for that and started working in, like, towards the end of 2013. And then by 2016, I just, it might have been the first time I popped my head up and kind of just, like, took a look around, and I'm like, man, there's just, there's just not a lot of support for the veterans. You know, a lot of things were geared towards active duty, which I totally get. So I decided that, I wanted to do something different. And I'm like, well, let me start up a nonprofit and just see how that guy goes. So I started up a nonprofit called Battle Brothers Foundation. And it's 501c3. And we help out with transitioning on the medical side. We'll help out with VA disability claims. If you're suffering from alcohol, opiate, post-traumatic stress, all the above, we can send you to treatment centers free of charge. Then the economic part was like trying to find that vet a job that was meaningful to them. So they wake up feeling that same purpose like they did while they served in uh, uniform with the hopes of them not making a mistake they can't come back from. And again, my body was still pretty much at war with itself. I had so much shrapnel throughout my body. I just couldn't sleep. And that's when someone said to me, why don't you try some cannabis? And I'm like, you know what? I'm desperate. I had no ill will towards cannabis, never used it before, but let's give it a shot. And it worked and it kept working. And I'm like, you know, I'm hundred percent disabled. I could go down to the VA, get all these pills, no one would bat an eye, but this green plant is meeting all the needs, so what is the problem here? So I went to Congress and talked with a couple of members of the United States Congress and said, what do you guys need to get this into the VA? And they said, if you can go get data and American doctors, you'll have a good argument. And so then later from there, I started diving more into the cannabis world, and I met a guy from a company called Niamedic that's out of Israel, and he was an, uh, part of the IDF. And he was saying, he's like, no, I think it's great. We're having some great results with it. You're going to need to get this thing called an institutional review board for anyone to take you serious. And I'm like, what is that? And it's like, well, it falls under the FDA. And it means that you've been cleared to use whatever you're testing on human subjects. So it's really hard to get. And it's going to be really expensive. And it's a Schedule One drug. Good luck. And then this idea came from a Paul Newman salad dressing bottle where it said 100% of profits to charity. And I thought, what if we start an adult use brand and we donate the profits from that back to Battle Brothers to fund the cannabis research. And talked to my lawyer and CPA, they said, yeah, that, that's totally viable, and came up with an idea, and I just walked downstairs, and we're about to have our first kid, and I'm making six figures at this company, and I'm like, listen, I, I, I got an idea, and I think I can help veterans with cannabis, but I'm gonna have to kind of start a company and go on my own to do this. and. She didn't even bat an eye. She was like, you got to do it. And that's when we started up a company called Hellman Valley Growers Company. And that's kind of a shout out to the Marine Raiders of the, of the Hellman. Hellman HVGC actually stands for Hellman Valley Gun Club. And if you're a Marine Raider and you served in the Hellman, you get an HVGC tattoo on you. So I threw that up on the wall. Hellman Valley Growers Company came really fast. And I asked the guys, I'm like, what do you guys think if you don't like it? I'll change it, we'll do something different. And they're like, not only do we love it, can we get a job with you when we get out? And that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. It was difficult in the beginning because I felt like I kind of lost my tribe. You know, Mosul was kicking off and everything and I couldn't even watch the news because I felt so ashamed I wasn't in those fights. And it took me probably about a year to get over that part. And then I was just dealing with the pain and 
you know, again, all my friends were still serving. It was just like, it felt weird. Like I was like, oh man, I'm a wuss. So I actually thought about getting back in again. But then when this idea came to me, you know, not only did cannabis save my life, but I think the purpose it set me on has saved my life because now I'm just mission driven. I feel like myself again, where I have goals that I have to achieve, working with it, collaborating with people. And it's kind of fun doing it in an austere environment. It's kind of like what we did in special ops. We might not have all the answers. We just had to kind of figure it out. You know, I tell people there was a study in Boston University did a white paper. And it was like, since the start of the global war on terrorism up until the withdrawal, we lost 7,070 men and women on the battlefield. During that same period, we lost nearly 37,000 to suicide, which I think that number is probably bigger. Um, Cause again, if you did it in a, in a vehicle, they're just gonna call it a vehicular accident, but you clearly know what you're trying to do there. So in theory, it's more dangerous for me sitting here telling this story than it was for me to be in the streets of Fallujah or the deserts of Africa or the Helmand Valley of Afghanistan. And that's just pretty crazy to me, but the Raider community has been hit. I think we've lost six, maybe seven guys over the past 22 months. These guys were out for like 10 years or something at this point, and there was no indicators. Nothing like, oh, they're getting divorced or this or that happened or lost their job. They ended up just doing it. Um, and you get those phone calls and it's crazy. So that's why I always tell people, you know, no matter what you can do, like if you got an opportunity, you know, someone's in town, call them up and go out and have some lunch or just call them up and have a talk. And you never know what those little things might do for someone else and for yourself. I think this is something we all kind of have to stay together. We all have to kind of continue to work together because no one will get it. No one will care about veterans as much as other veterans for each other. You know, one thing I say to people you know, with my friends who I served with, it's like, if you're gonna make that decision to do that, you owe me a phone call. All right, just give me one phone call. Because what I don't think people realize is the collateral damage you leave behind. I mean, that family forever is going to be just wondering what could have they done or, I, I mean, I'm not like saying like, oh, you're taking the easy way out. You're leaving and whatever happens, happens to you. But think about everything else behind you and what you just did to their lives and stuff like that. And there's nothing that can't be solved with some conversations or something. I'm not going to say maybe you lost a lot of money and that's terrible. I get it. But Money comes, money goes. You know, the, the families, the relationships, that's priceless. And that's where you've really got to kind of take a look at yourself. If I do this, what am I leaving behind? And it's not going to be good. You know, in terms of people anxious about getting into a war, I totally get it. I couldn't wait to go see what it was like. And again, you hear people say the story, like, careful what you wish for. War has enveloped itself around my soul and it will never leave. I mean, I have, just like every veteran, we all have our demons and you never get rid of them. You just gotta learn to live above them each day. But I get it. And we want people who are anxious, those competitors who wanna get into the fight because that's ultimately, there's gonna be more wars. It's like, what did Plato say it? Like only the dead have seen the end of war. I mean, it's gonna continuously happen. So I don't wanna say yes, I'm mean, according like careful what you wish for. It's gonna be different than what you thought. There's nothing romantic about it. Literally in a situation that is dangerous, you shouldn't be afraid, not at all. I mean, if you are, use that fear to make you more sharp and to make you more lethal. And you do what you gotta do, or, you know, fight just and all that stuff. But it's ultimately gonna come down to the guys to your left and right. Uh, that's when, you know, when the rubber hits the road, that's what it's coming down to. And you'll do whatever you have to do for your brothers and they're gonna do whatever they have to do for you. And it's an amazing thing and that's one of the, great things that comes from it, I guess you could say, if you want to use the words great with war, but that bond, it will never leave. I mean, I literally had a buddy uh, call me up Saturday, said he needed a place to crash who I served with, and he just comes over and crashes. It's like not a big deal and stuff like that. But I don't know how many other occupations would have that. And again, I don't even want to use the word occupation. I think you got to look at yourself as a professional. Just like there's professional football players, you're a professional warrior. Never do something stupid to just get into a fight. You know, I'll just say anyone, if, if you, uh, you know, enjoyed and understand what we're kind of going through here, you can check out my nonprofit, Battle Brothers Foundation, www.battlebrothersfoundation.org. Every dollar counts. We're doing some really progressive things here with our Veteran Medical Cannabis Research Initiative. And if you're local here in California, purchase some Hellman Valley Growers Company product. That dollar will go beyond 
an award-winning product. It's going to go help save the lives of veterans. So I'd really appreciate your support on both sides.